Hey, it's Skittles, and it's been a long time since I've uploaded anything of actual substance, but here I am. Uh, I've been streaming over on Twitch, and I had the idea a couple weeks ago to read through live uh, Sword Art Online progress Progressive Book 1 right here, and uh, people on Twitter seem to enjoy that idea, so I live-streamed myself reading the first half of the book, which covers the entire first floor of Aincrad. Uh, if you haven't watched Sword Art Online, uh, in quick synopsis, uh, it is the story of 10,000 people being trapped inside a virtual world. And if they die in the game, they die in real life. That is probably the quickest I'm going to be able to explain the plot. But, uh, yeah, I'm about to listen to me read through the entire first few chapters. I think it's 15 chapters of the first floor. And yeah, hopefully you enjoy. And uh, if you do, uh, subscribe here or you can go follow me over on Twitch. I'll leave a link in the description below. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Private Skills and I'll be reading Sword Art Online Progressive Book 1 written by Ricky Kawahara Illustrated by Abek and BP. The first section of the book, as I might have mentioned, is called Aria of a Starless Night. The first floor of Aincrad, November 2022. Just once, I saw an actual shooting star. It wasn't on a camping trip under the stars, but from my bedroom window. This wouldn't be such a rare thing to those who live in places with clear skies or that are properly dark at night. But my home of 14 years, Kawagoe in Saitama Prefecture, was neither of those things. Even on a clear night, you could only see the brightest of stars with the naked eye. But one midwinter night, I just so happened to glance out the window and caught a glimpse of a momentary brilliance falling vertically through a starless night sky, pale with the light of the city. I was in fourth or fifth grade at the time, and in my innocent youth, I decided to make a wish, only to squander it on the most pointless thing imaginable. I wished the next monster would drop a rare item. I was in the middle of grinding for a level up, and my favorite MMORPG at the time. I saw another shooting star of the same color and speed three, or perhaps four, years later. But this was not with the naked eye, and it did not flash against the gray night sky. It happened within the murky depths of a labyrinth created by the Nerve Gear, the world's first full sensory immersive VR experience. The way the fencer fought brought the word possessed to mind. He darted out of the way of the level 6 ruined kobold trooper's crude axe so tightly, I felt a chill run down my back. After three successful evasions, the kobold's balance was entirely lost, and he unleashed a full power sword skill into the helpless beast. He used linear, a simple thrust that was the first attack any anyone learned in the rapier category. It was a very ordinary attack, a twisting thrust straight forward from a centered position, but his speed was astonishing. It was clearly not just the game's motion assistance systems at work, but rather the product of his own athletic skill. I'd seen party members and enemy monsters use the same skill countless times before during the beta test, but all I could catch this time was the visual effect of the sword's trajectory, and not a glimpse of the blade itself. The sudden flash of pure light in the midst of the dim dungeon brought the memory of that shooting star to mind. After three repetitions of the same pattern of dodging the kobold's combo and responding with linear, the vincer had dispatched the arms creature, one of the toughest in the dungeon, without taking a scratch. But it was not a lazy, easy battle. 
Once the final thrust had ripped through the kobold's chest and sent it bursting into empty polygonal shards, he stumbled back and thudded against the wall, as though the creature's disintegration had pushed him backward. The man slid down the wall until he sat on the floor, breathing heavily. He hadn't noticed me standing at a tunnel intersection about 15 yards away. My normal activity at this point would be to silently slink away and find my own prey to hunt. Ever since I'd made the decision one month ago to work as a self-interested solo player, I had never gone out of my way to approach another person. The only exception would be if I saw someone battling and in mortal danger, but the fencer had never dipped below full health. At the very least, he didn't seem to need anyone barging in and offering to help. But still, I hesitated for five seconds then made up my mind and strode forward in the direction of the sitting player. He was skinny and undersized, wearing a light bronze breastplate over a deep red leather tunic. Tight-fitting leather pants and knee-high boots, his face was hidden beneath the hooded cape that hung from head to waist. Everything aside from the cape was proper light armor for a nimble fencer. But it was also similar to my swordsman's wear. My beloved Anio Blade. A reward for a high-level quest was so heavy that I needed to cut down on bulky equipment to keep my moves sharp. I didn't wear anything heavier than a dark gray leather coat and a small breastplate. The fencer flinched when he heard my footsteps, but didn't move farther. He would have seen the green color of my cursor to reassure him that I was not a monster. His head stayed hung between his upturned knees. A clear sign that he wanted me to keep walking past, but I stopped a few feet away. A bit overkill, if you ask me. The slender shoulders under the thick cape shrugged again. The hood shifted back just an inch or two, and I saw two sharp eyes glaring at me. All I could see were two light brown irises. The contours of his face were still shadowed. After several seconds of a glare just as piercing as those rapier thrusts, he tilted his head slightly to the side. It seemed to suggest that he didn't understand what I meant. Inwardly, I heaved a sigh of resignation. There was one massive itch in the back of my mind that kept me from continuing on my solitary way. The fencer's linear was chillingly perfect. Not only were the pre- and post-motions extremely brief, the attack itself was faster than I could see. I'd never been in the presence of such a terrifying and beautiful sword skill before. At first, I assumed he must have been another former beta tester. That speed had to have com com come from, a pl from plenty of experience gained before this world had plunged into its currently deadly state. But when I saw that linear a second time, it began to question my assumption. In comparison to the excellence of his attack, the fencer's battle flow was downright perilous. Yes, the defensive strategy of dodging enemy strikes with a minimum with a minimum of movement led to quicker counter strikes than blocking or parrying, as well as saving wear and tear on equipment. But the consequences of failure far outweighed those positives. In a worst case scenario, a successful hit by the enemy might be treated as a counterattack that included a brief stun effect. For a solo fighter, getting stunned was a kiss of death. It didn't add up. Brilliant swordplay combined with downright reckless strategy. I wanted to know why, so I approached and wondered out loud if it might be overkill. But he didn't even understand that extremely common online term. The fencer sitting on the floor here could not be a beta tester. He might not have even been an MMO player before coming to the game. I took a quick breath and launched into an explanation. Overkill is a term used when you do way too much damage for the amount of health the monster has left. After your second linear, the kobold was nearly dead. It only had two or three pixels left on its HP bar. You could have finished it off easily with a light attack, rather than going for a full sword skill. How many days had it been since I'd said so many words at once? How many weeks? 
For being a poor Japanese student, my explanation wasn't as elegant as an essay, but the fencer showed no response for a full ten seconds. Finally, a soft voice muttered from the depths of the hood. Is there a problem with doing too much damage? Finally, at long last, I realized that the squatting fencer was the rarest of encounters in this entire world. To say nothing of deep in a dungeon, not a male player, but a woman. The world's first VR MMORPG, Sword Art Online, had opened its virtual doors nearly a month before. In your average MMO, players would be hitting the initial level cap, and the entire game world would have been thoroughly explored from end to end. But here in SAO, even the best players in the game were barely around level 10, and no one knew what the cap was. Barely a few, per barely a few percent of the game setting, the floating castle Einkrad had been mapped out. SAO was not quite a game anymore. It was more of a prison. Logging out was impossible, and the death of the player's avatar resulted in the death of the player's body. Period. Under those stark circumstances, few people dared risk the danger of a dungeon mass monsters in traps. On top of that, the Game Master forced every player's avatar into their real-life gender, which meant there was a massive shortage of females in the game. I'd assumed that most of them were still camped out in the safe haven of the Town of Beginnings. I'd only spotted women two or three times in this massive dungeon, the first floor labyrinth, and they were all in the midst of large adventuring parties. Thus, it never occurred to me that this solitary fencer at the edge of the unexplored territory deep in the dungeon might actually be a woman. I briefly considered mumbling an apology and leaving in haste. I wasn't on a crusade against the men who always made it... I wasn't on a crusade against the men who always made it a point to talk to any female player than saw, they saw without hesitation, but I most definitely did not want to be identified as one of them. If she'd responded with a, with a mind your own beeswax, or I can do what I want, I'd have no choice but to agree and move along. But the fencer's response seemed to be an honest question, so I stopped and tried to come up with a proper explanation. Well, there's no penalty in the game for overkilling. It's just inefficient. Sword skills take a lot to con a lot of concentration. So the more you use them, the more exhausted you get. I mean, you've still got to get back home, right? You should try to conserve more energy. Get back home? The voice from the hood questioned again. It was a ragged monotone, seemingly exhausted, but I thought it was beautiful. I didn't say that out loud, of course. Instead, I tried to elaborate. Yeah, it's going to take a good hour to get out of the labyrinth from this spot. And even the closest town is another 30 minutes from there, right? You'll make more mistakes when you're tired. You look like a solo player to me. Those mistakes can easily turn fatal. As I spoke, I wondered to myself why I was lecturing her so earnestly. It wasn't because she was a girl, I thought. I had started this conversation before realizing her gender. If the roles were reversed and someone was haughtily lecturing me about what I should do, I'd certainly tell them to go to hell. Once I realized how contradictory my actions were to my personality, the fencer finally reacted. In that case, there's no problem. I'm not going home. Huh? You're not going back to town? What about your refilling on potions, repairing equipment, getting sleep? I asked. Incredulous, she shrugged briefly. Don't need potions if I don't take damage. And I bought five of the same sort. If I need sleep, I just get it at a nearby safe area. She said hoarsely. I had no response. The safe area was a small room located inside the dungeon that was never in danger of spawning any monsters. It was easily distinguished by its colored torches in either corner of the room. They were useful as a foothold when hunting or mapping out a dungeon, but they weren't meant for, for more than an hour-long nap. The rooms had no beds, only hard stone floors, and the open doorway didn't keep out the incessant sounds of monsters' footsteps and growling in the corridor outside. Even the stoutest of adventurers couldn't get honest sleep under such conditions. 
but if I was to take her statement at face value, she was using that cramped stone chamber as a replacement for a proper inn room in order to camp out permanently inside the dungeon. Could that possibly be right? Um, how many hours have you been in here? I asked, afraid to know the answer. She exhaled slowly. Three days? Maybe four? Are you done? The next monster is going to spawn soon, so I need to get moving. She put a fragile gloved hand against the dungeon wall and unsteadily climbed to her feet, with the rapier dangling from her hand as heavily as a two-handed sword. She turned her back to me. As she walked forward, I saw ragged tears in the cape, tears in the cape, that spoke to its poor condition. In fact, it was a miracle that after four days of camping out in a dungeon, the flimsy cloth was intact at all. Perhaps her statement about not taking any damage wasn't an idle boast. Even if I didn't... Even I didn't expect the words that tumbled out of my mouth and at her receding back. If you keep fighting like this, you're gonna die. She stopped still and let her right shoulder rest against the wall before turning around. The eyes I thought were hazel under that hood now seemed to flash a pale, piercing red. We're all going to die anyway. Her hoarse, cracking voice seemed to deepen the chill of the dungeon air. Two thousand people died in a single month, and we haven't even finished the first floor. There's no way to beat this game. The only difference is when and where you die. Sooner or later. The longest and most emotional statement she'd uttered so far passed her lips and hung in the air. I instinctively took a step forward, then watched as she quietly crashed to the floor, as thought hit by an invis as though hit by an invisible paralysis. Chapter two. The moment she hit the floor, the only thought that passed through her brain was the mundane question. I wonder what happens when you pass out in a virtual world. Falling unconscious was a momentary shutdown of the brain, caused by the stoppage of blood flow. Blood might stop flowing for a variety of reasons. Heart or blood vessel malfunctions, anemia, low blood pressure, hyperventilation... But under a VR full dive, the physical body was already utterly stationary in a bed or reclining chair. On top of that, everyone stuck in this particular game of death had presumably been transferred to a nearby medical facility where they'd be undergoing regular monitoring and the administration of necessary drugs and fluids. It was hard to imagine someone passing out from purely physical reasons. These thoughts ran through her fading consciousness and eventually coalesced into a simple statement. I just don't care anymore. Nothing mattered. She was going to die here. If she passed out in the middle of the labyrinth guarded by deadly monsters, there was no way she'd emerge safely. There was another player nearby, but he wouldn't risk his own life just to save a stranger. Besides, how would he save her? The weight that a player could carry in this virtual world was strictly controlled by the game system. Deep in a dangerous dungeon like this, any player would be heavily laden with potions and emergency supplies, not to mention all of the loot they'd procured along the way. It was impossible to imagine anyone carrying another human being on top of all that. Then she realized something. For fleeting thoughts escaping her brain just before she fell unconscious, they were certainly lasting quite a while. Plus, it was only hard stone beneath her body, so why did she feel something so soft and gentle pressing against her back? She felt warm, somehow. There was even a light breeze tickling her cheek. With a start, her eyes snapped open. She wasn't in a dark dungeon surrounded by clammy stone walls. It was a clearing in the midst of a forest surrounded by ancient trees engraved with golden moss and thorny bushes bearing small flowers. She'd passed out, no, been sleeping, on a bed of grass as soft as carpet 
in the middle of the round clearing, measuring roughly eight yards across. But how? She lost consciousness deep in that dungeon, so how could she have traveled all the way to this outdoor area? The answer was 90 degrees to her right. There was a gray shadow huddled at the foot of an especially large tree at the edge of the open space. He cradled a large sword with both hands and had his head resting on the scabbard. His face was hidden beneath longish black bangs, but based on the equipment and profile, it had to be the player who'd been talking to her moments before she passed out. He must have found some way to carry her out of the dungeon and to this forest. She scanned the line of trees until on her left she finally spotted a massive tower stretching upward to the roof a few hundred feet away, the labyrinth of the first floor of Aincrad. She turned back to her right, perhaps sensing her movement. The man's shoulders twitched beneath the gray leather coat, and his head rose slightly. Even in the midst of the midday forest sun, his eyes were as black as a starless night. The instant she crossed gazes with those pitch black eyes, a tiny firework went off deep in the back of her mind. You shouldn't have bothered, growled Asuna Yuki, past gritting teeth. From the moment she'd been trapped in this world, Asuna had asked herself the same questions hundreds of times, if not thousands. Why did she decide to play with that brand new gaming console when it wasn't even hers? Why did she put the helmet on her head, sink into the high-backed me high mesh chair, and utter the startup command? Asuna hadn't bought the Nerve Gear VR interface of dreams turned cursed tool of death. Or the game card for Sword Art Online. Fast prison of souls that had been her much older brother. I'm sorry. <laughs> Asuna hadn't bought the Nerve Gear, VR interface of dreams turned curse tool of death, or the game card for Sword Art Online, Vast Prison of Souls. That had been her much older brother, Koichiro, who ev but even he'd never been one for video games, much less MMORPGs. As the son of the representative director for RCT, one of the biggest electronic manufacturers in the country, he underwent every kind of education necessary to be their father's successor, and everything that didn't fall under that duty was eliminated from his life. Why he became interested in Nerve Gear, why he chose SAO, was still a mystery to her. But, ironically, Koichiro never got a chance to play the first video game he'd ever bought. On the very day that SAO launched, he was sent on a business trip overseas, at the dinner table the night before, he tried to laugh off the frustration, but she could sense he already was disappointed. Asuna's life hadn't been quite as strict as Koichiro's, but she too had little experience with games aside from free downloads on her phone. Even up to her current age in ninth grade, she was aware of the process of the presence of online games. But the entrance exams for high school were fast approaching, and she had no reason or motive to seek them out, supposedly. So even she had no explanation why, on the afternoon of November 6th, 2022, she'd slipped into her brother's vacant room, put the already prepared nerve gear on her head, and spoken the link start command. The only thing she could say was that everything had changed that day. Everything had ended. Asuna locked herself inside an inn room in the town of Beginnings, watching for the ordeal to be waiting for the ordeal to be over. But when not a single message had made its way through from the real world in two weeks, she gave up hoping for rescue from the outside. And with over a thousand players already dead, and the first dungeon of the game still unbeaten, she understood that defeating the game from the inside was equally impossible. The only chef choice left was how to die. She had the option of waiting for months, possibly years, within the safety of the city, but no one can guarantee that rule the monsters couldn't invade towns 
would never be broken. Austin preferred to leave the city rather than curl up into a ball in the dark, living in fear of the future. She'd use all of her instincts to fight, learn, and grow. If she ultimately ran out of steam and perished, at least she didn't spend her remaining days regretting the decisions of the past and mourning her lost future. Run, thrust, and vanish, like a meteor burning up through the atmosphere. Such was Austin's mindset as she left the inn and headed out into the wilderness. Totally ignorant of a single MMORPG term, she picked out a new weapon, learned a single skill, and found her way deep into the labyrinth that no one else had successfully conquered. Finally, at four in the morning on Friday, December 2nd, the accumulation of so many battles caused her to black out with exhaustion. And her quest should have ended. The name Asuna, carved into the monument of life beneath Black Iron Palace, would be struck through and everyone would come to a close. It would have. It should have. You shouldn't have, Asuna repeated. The slumping, black-haired swordsman drooped his eyes, dark as night. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The slumping, black-haired swordsman dropped his eyes, dark as night, down to the ground. He seemed to be slightly older than her, but the surprising naivety of his gesture, su gesture surprised her. A few seconds later, her original suspicion returned as a cynical smile crossed his lips. I didn't save you, he said quietly. It was the voice of a boy, but something in it distinguished, disguised his actual age. Why didn't you leave me back there, then? I only wanted to save your map data. If you spent four days at the front line, you must have mapped out a good chunk of the unexplored land. It would be a waste to let that disappear. She sucked in a breath at the logic and efficiency of his explanation. She was expecting the same answer that most people she'd met had given her. Some claptrap about the importance of life, or the need for everyone to band together. She'd been prepared to cut through all of that nonsense. Verbally, of course, but the practicality of his answer left her speechless. Fine, take it, she muttered, opening her window. She'd finally gotten used to the menu system, tabbing over to access her map info and copying it to a scroll of parchment. Another button command materialized the scroll as an in-game object, and she tossed it to the man's feet. Now you've got what you wanted. So long. She put a hand in the grass to get to her feet, but her legs wouldn't stay steady. The clock in her window showed that she'd been out almost a full seven hours, but her exhaustion hadn't entirely worn off yet. She still had three more rapiers, though. She told herself before she left that she'd stay inside the tower until the last one's durability level was below halfway. There were still a few suspicious lurking suspicions lurking in the back of her mind. How had the swordsman in the gray coat managed to bring her out of the dungeon to this forest clearing? And why did he take her all the way outside rather than just to the nearby safe zone within the tower? They weren't worth turning back to ask him about, however. So Asuna turned to her left in the direction of the black looming labyrinth and started to march off. Hang on, Fencer. She ignored him and kept walking, but what he said next made her stop in her tracks. You're doing all of this for the purpose of beating the game, right? Not just to die in a dungeon? So why don't you come to the meeting? Meeting? She wondered aloud. The swordsman's explanation reached her ears to the gentle forest breeze. There's going to be a meeting tonight in the town of Tolbana near the tower. They're going to plan out how to beat the boss at the first floor labyrinth. Chapter 3 Einkrad was broadly conical in shape. So the lowest floor was therefore the largest. The circular floor was about six miles across 
with a surface of over 30 square miles. In comparison, the city of Kawagoe in Saitama Prefecture, home of over 300,000, was a little over 38 square miles. Because of its size, there was actually a considerable variety of terrain to be found. At the southern tip of the landmass was the town of Beginnings, a city over half a mile across, surrounded by a semicircular wall. Outside of the city were rippling plains filled with boars and wolves, as well as insect monsters such as worms, beetles, and wasps. Across the field to the northwest was a deep forest. While the northeast held swampy lowlands dotted with lakes, Beyond these regions lay mountains, valleys, and ruins, each full of appropriate assortments of monsters. At the northern end of the floor was a squat tower 300 yards across and 100 yards tall, the first floor labyrinth. Aside from the town of beginnings, the floor was dotted with a number of other settlements in various sizes, the largest of which though only 200 yards from one end to the other, was Tolbana, a valley town closest to the Flores Labyrinth. The first visit by a player to this tranquil town lined with massive windmills was three weeks after the official launch of Sword Art Online. By that time, over 1,800 players had perished. The mysterious fencer and I left the forest not together but at an awkward distance, and passed through the northern gate of Tolvana. A purple message in my field of vision stating safe haven indicated that we were within town limits. Instantly, I felt the exhaustion of the long day settle onto my shoulders, and a sigh escaped my lips. If I felt this bad after only leaving the town that morning, the fencer behind me must have felt much worse. I turned back to check on her, but her knee-high boots did not falter. A few hours of sleep couldn't have erased the fatigue of three days of straight combat, so she must have been putting on a brave front. It seemed like returning to town ought to be cause for relaxing, both mind and body, and in this virtual setting, they were the same thing. But she didn't appear to be in the mood for suggestions. Instead, I kept things short and sweet. The meeting's at the town square, four in, a, four in the afternoon. The face within the hood nodded slightly, but she kept walking right past me. A slight breeze running through the valley town rippled her cape as she passed. I briefly opened my mouth, but found nothing to say. I'd spent the last month vigorously avoiding all human contact as a solo player. I had no right to expect anyone to welcome me with open arms. The only concern I'd had was in saving my own life. Strange girl, yeah? A voice smuttered from behind me. I tore my gaze away from the fencer and turned around. Seems to be on death's door, but never dies. Clearly a newbie, but her moves are sharp as steel. Who can she be? The voice, high-pitched, wheedled that... <laughs> The voice, a high-pitched weedle that rose into an odd nasal line at the end of each sentence, belonged to a slippery little player, an entire head shorter than me. Like me, she wore only cloth and leather armor. The weapons on her waist were a small claw and some throwing needles. It didn't seem like the kind of stuff that would get her out to, the, out to this dangerous zone, but this person's greatest weapon did not have a blade. You know that fencer? I asked her automatically, then grimaced, anticipating her answer. Sure enough, the little woman held up a hand, all five fingers extended. I make a cheat. Five hundred coal? The smiling face had only one very distinct feature. She'd used a cosmetic item to draw three lines on either cheek in the, in the style of animal whiskers. Combined with her short, mousy brown curls, the overall effect was unmistakably rodent-like. I'd asked her why she chose that appearance before, but her only response was, You don't ask a girl the reason she puts on makeup, do you? I'll tell you for 100,000 coal. So the answer was still a mystery. 
I silently swore to myself that one day I'd actually cash in a rare item and pay the exorbitant fee just to force an answer out of her. I don't feel comfortable trafficking in a girl's private information, I muttered sternly. <laughs> Good mindset to have, she said smarmingly. Argo the rat, the first information trader in Aincrad, chittered with laughter. Watch out, five minutes of chatting with the rat, and she'll have worked a hundred coal out of you. Someone had warned me once. But according to Argo, she'd never once sold a piece of information whose verification was unclear. She always paid a source for her info she considered worth something, and only turned it into a product to sell once she'd made sure the story was solid. It seemed clear to me that a single piece of poor intel sold for cash would ruin her reputation. So while it wasn't exactly the same as farming ingredients in dungeons and selling them to NPCs, as a business, it had its own set of perils. Although I knew my skepticism was sexist, I couldn't help but wondering why a female player would choose to dabble in such dangerous work. But I knew that if I asked, she'd quote me another piece of 100,000 coal, so I separated my throat and asked a different question. Well, is it the usual proxy negotiation today rather than your main business? Now it was Argo's turn to scowl. She looked back and forth, then prodded my back with a finger, guiding me to a nearby alleyway. With the boss meeting a full two hours away, there were a few players milling about the town, but it seemed to be important that she not be overheard, probably something to do with her reputation as a guardian of secrets. Argo came to a stop in the narrow alley and rested her back on the wall of the house inhabited by an NPC, of course, before nodding. Yeah, that's right. They'll go up to 29,800 coal. 29, huh? I grimaced and shrugged. Sorry, my answer's the same. No matter the number, not gonna sell. That's what I told the client, but what can you do? Argo's main business was selling information, but she used her excellent agility stat to moonlight as a messenger. Normally, she simply passed along brief verbal or written messages, but for the past week, she'd been a pipeline to me for someone very insistent, if not downright pushy. He, or she, wanted to buy my annual blade plus six. 3S 3D. The weapon strengthened system... The weapon strengthening system in SAO was relatively simple for a modern MMORPG. There were five parameters, sharpness, quickness, accuracy, heaviness, and durability. For a price, an NPC or player blacksmith could attempt to raise a particular stat for you. The process required specific crafting materials depending on the stat, and there was always a probability that it would fail. This was similar to the way it worked in other games. Each time a parameter was successfully raised, the weapon name gained a plus one or plus two, and so on. So the actual statistic being affected wasn't clear until you tapped on the item properties directly. Since it would be a pain to say plus one to accuracy and plus two to heaviness each time you traded with another player, it was common to abbreviate the information instead. Therefore, a plus one weapon with one to accuracy, two to heaviness, and three to dur or one to durability would be labeled 1A2H1D. My annual blade plus six, 3S 3D, increased sharpness and durability by three points each. It took quite a lot of persistence and good fortune to improve it that much on the first floor. Few players bothered to work on the blacksmithing skill, which had no bearing on your odds of survival, and despite the dwarvish appearance of the NPC blacksmiths, their actual skill was sorely disappointing. Even the base weapon was the reward of an extremely tough quest, so the sword's current values had to be about the maximum a player could expect to find on the first floor. But it was still starter equipment. It, I might pump it up a few more times, but I'd find a better sword on the third or fourth floor, and the process would begin all over again. For that reason, I had a hard time fathoming the motive 
of Argos clients to pay the massive sum of 29,800 coal for such a weapon. In a face-to-face -face negotiation, I could simply ask the buyer, but without a name to track down, there was no way to find out about them. And how much more are they paying to keep you quiet? A thousand, I asked. Igo nodded. Yeah, I'd say so. Feel like up in the ante? Hmm. 1K, huh? Hmm. This hush money was a fee that Mystery Bitter X was paying Argo to keep their identity hidden. If I offered to pay 1,100 coal, Argo would pass that along via instant message until they came back with 1,200 coal. Then I'd be asked to pony up 1,300 and so on. If I ended up winning the bidding war, I'd learn who wanted to buy my sword. So I'd end up losing a significant amount of cash. So that would clearly be an idiotic outcome. Great, so you're an information broker who makes money even when you don't sell. Gotta admire your dedication to your business, I grumbled. Argo's whiskered face broke into a grin and she hissed with laughter. That's the best part about it, see? The moment I sell a piece of intel, I've got a brand new product to sell. So and so just bought so and such and such information. It's twice the profit. In real life, an attorney would never reveal the name of her client. But given that Rat's motto of all information has a price, she didn't seem to honor that taboo. Anyone who wanted to make a deal with her needed to know beforehand that her own information could be sold. But when her product was so excellent, who could complain about that price? If any female players want my personal information, let me know so I can buy theirs first, I said wearingly. Argo crackled again, but then put on a serious expression. Okay, I'll tell the client you refused again. I'll even throw in my opinion that they won't get through to you. So long, key boy. The rat turned and waved, then darted back out of the alley as nimbly as her namesake. After a momentary glimpse of her brown curls vanishing into the crowd, I felt sure she'd never get herself killed. I'd learned several things over the first month of SAO, the game of death. What separated a player's likelihood of life and death? There were an infinite number of variables. Stock of potions, knowing when to leave a dungeon, and so on. But somewhere in the center of those swirling factors was the presence of a person's core. Something they could, they could believe unconditionally. You might call it one's greatest weapon. A necessary tool for survival. For Argo, that was information. She knew everything crucial, where the, dunge where the dangerous monsters were, and the most efficient places to hunt. That knowledge gave her confidence and a cool head, which raised her chances of survival. What was my core? It had to be the sword on my back. More precisely, it was the feeling I got when my blade and I became one. I'd only managed to reach that mental zone a few times, but it was the desire to control that power at will, to be the unquestioned ruler of that realm, that drove me to stay alive. The reason I'd put points into sharpness and durability rather than quickness and or accuracy was simple. The former were pure numerical increases, but the latter adjusted the system itself. They changed the sensation of swinging the sword. But in that case, what about the fencer on the frontier of the labyrinth? What was her core? I'd transported her outside of the dungeon, using means I could never tell her. But if I hadn't been there, would she really have died? I could easily imagine her unconsciously getting to her feet as the next kobold approached, using her shooting star linear to dispatch the beast. What drove her to undergo such a ferocious string of battles? What had kept her alive up to this point? She must have some source of strength, I could only imagine. Maybe I should have paid Argo the 500 coal, I muttered, then shook my head and looked upward. The white painted windmills that were the de defining symbol of Tolbana had just a tinge of orange to them. It was a bit past three o'clock 
Time to grab a bite to eat before the undoubtedly long and tedious boss raid meeting. When the meeting started at four, things would get ugly. Today, for the first time, one hidden fissure between SAO players would come into clarity. The unbridgeable gap between new players and beta testers. There's only one piece of information that Argo the Rat refused to sell to others, and that was whether a person had been a beta tester or not. She wasn't alone in that philosophy. All former testers who could recognize one another by name or voice, if not face, intentionally avoided reaching out to each other. The previous encounter was no different. Both Argo and I knew the other was a beta tester, but we went light years out of our way to never discuss it. The reason was simple. Being publicly outed as a beta tester could be fatal. Not because of monsters in a dungeon, but because if you wandered alone in the game map, you could be executed by a lynch mob of new players. They believed that the deaths of 2,000 players within a month could be laid at the feet of the beta testers. And I couldn't totally deny that charge. Chapter 4 For her first meal in three or possibly even four days, Asuna chose a heel of the cheapest black bread the NPCs in town sold, as well as the free water available at many fountains around the place. She'd never particularly enjoyed eating in real life, but the total emptiness of eating in this world was hard to describe. No matter how gorgeous the feast might appear, not a single grain of sugar or salt reached her real body. It seemed to her that they should have eliminated the concept of hunger and fullness altogether, but the virtual body craved food three times a day, and the pangs did not disappear unless virtual food was eaten. She learned how to shut out the feeling of hunger through sheer willpower while lurking in the dungeon, but there was no hiding the need once back in town. As an act of protest, she always chose the cheapest possible option, but it made her angry, in a way that even the rough black, black bread eaten a scrap at a time actually tasted pretty good. Asuna was sitting on a simple wooden bench next to the fountain square in the center of Tolbana, chewing away with her hood pulled low. For only costing a single coal, the bread was fairly large, just as she'd finished half of it. Pretty good, isn't it? A voice came from her right. Her fingers stopped in the act of ripping another piece free, and she threw a sharp glare in that direction. It was the man she'd just left behind at the town entrance a few minutes ago. The black-haired swordsman in the gray coat. The meddlesome stranger who'd somehow transported her unconscious body outside of the dungeon, keeping her journey going when it should have ended. Her cheeks suddenly grew hot at the thought. After all of her bold statements about dying, not only was she alive, but she'd seen she'd been seen chowing down another meal. Her entrant her entire being was racked with shame, and she froze with the crescent of bread in her hands, uncertain of how to respond. The man eventually coughed politely and asked, May I sit next to you? Normally she would silently stand up and leave without a second glance, but in this unfamiliar situation she was at a loss. Taking Asuna's lack of response as silent permission, he sat down on the far right corner of the bench and rummaged in his pocket, giving her as much space as possible. When his hand reappeared, it was holding a round black object, a one coal roll of black bread. For an instant, Asuna forgot her shame and confusion and looked up at him in simple astonishment. If he was good enough to have reached the deep spot in the in the labyrinth and have such excellent equipment, the swordsman must have enough money to afford a full course meal at a nice restaurant. Was he just a cheapskate, or... Do you really think that tastes good? She asked, before she could stop herself. His eyebrows took on an expression of hurt dignity, and he nodded vigorously. Of course. I've eaten one every day since I got to this town. Of 
I throw, of course I throw in a little wrinkle. Wrinkle? She tilted her head in confusion beneath the hood. Rather than explain out loud, a swordsman reached into his other pocket and produced a small porcelain jar. He set it down on the bench between them and said, Use this on your bread. For a moment, she wasn't sure what he meant by use it on the bread, and then realized that it was a common video game phrase. Use the key on the door, use the bottle on the spring, and so on. She reluctantly reached out and touched the lid of the jar with a fingertip. She selected use on the pop-up menu that appeared, and her finger started glowing purple. The signal for target selection mode. By touching the black bread on her left hand, the objects would interact. With a brief jingle, the bread was suddenly white, coated, no, covered, with a thick substance that appeared to be cream? Where did you get this? It was the reward for the Revenge of the Cows quest in the last town. It takes a long time to beat, so I don't think many people have bothered to finish it, he said seriously using the jar on his bread with a practiced motion. It must have been the last of the container because the jar flashed, tinkled, and disappeared. She opened his, he opened his mouth wide and took a large bite of his cream-slathered bread. His chewing was so vigorous that she could practically hear the sound effects, and Asuna realized that for the first time in ages, her stomach pangs were not an unpleasant pain, but the healthy sign of honest hunger. She took a hesitant bite of the creamy bread in her hand. Suddenly, the rough, dry bread she'd been eating had turned into a heavy, rustic cake. The cream was sweet and smooth, with a refreshing tartness like yogurt. Asuna took a few more rapturous bites, her cheeks packed full with a numbing sense of contentment. The next thing she knew, there was not a single crumb left of the item in her hands. She looked over with a start to see that she'd finished her food just two seconds before the swordsman. Overcome with shame again, she wanted to get up and run off, but couldn't bring herself to be so rude to the man who just treated her to a tasty meal. Breathing heavily, attempting to get her mind in order, Asuna finally managed to squeak out a polite response. Thanks for the food. You're welcome. Done with his meal, the swordsman clapped his fingerless gloved hands together and continued. If you want to do that cow quest I mentioned, there's a trick to it. If you're efficient, you can beat it in just two hours. She couldn't deny the temptation. With that yogurt cream, her cheap black bread turned into a proper feast. It was only an artificial satisfaction created by the game's flavor modeling system, but she wanted it again, every day if possible. But Asuna looked down and quietly shook her head. I'll pass. I didn't come to this town in order to get food. I see. Why then? While the swordsman's voice wasn't particularly melodious, there was a boyish inflection to it that was not displeasing to her ears in the least. It was perhaps this feature that led her to speak what was on her mind, something she hadn't done with anyone else in this world. So that I can be myself. If I was going to just hide back in the first city and waste away, I'd rather be myself until the very last moment, even if it means dying at the hands of a monster. I don't want to let this game beat me. I won't let it happen. The 15 years of Asuna Yuki's life had been a long series of battles. It started with the entrance exams to kindergarten, and followed with an endless succession of tests big and small. She'd beaten them all. Losing in a single instance would mean that her life was no longer of any worth, and she'd successfully shouldered that pressure since the very start. But after 15 years of winning, this test, Sword Art Online, would likely be the end of her. It was too mysterious to her, a culture steeped in foreign and unfamiliar rules, and it was not the kind of battle that could be won alone. 
The only means of victory was reaching the very top of the giant floating castle, a full hundred floors above, and beating the final enemy. But a month after the start of the game, one-fifth of the players were already gone, and most of them were experienced in ways of these things. The forces left behind were too weak, and the path ahead was so very, very long. As though the faucet holding her innermost feelings had been opened the tiniest bit, the words trickled drop by drop out of her mouth. The confession came in fragments, pieces of logic that didn't add up to full sentences, but the black-haired swordsman sat and listened in silence. When Asuna's voice had died away in the evening breeze, he finally spoke. I'm sorry. A few seconds later, Asuna skeptically wondered why he would say that. She'd only met him today. He had no reason to apologize to her. She peered to her right and saw that he was hunched over on the bench, his elbows on his knees, his lips shifted, and more faint words reached her ears. I'm sorry. This current situation, the reason you feel so pressured, is my... But she couldn't make out the rest. The especially large windmill in the center of town started ringing and its winds powered clock bell. It was four o'clock, the time of the meeting. She looked up and saw that the large number of players had gathered across the fountain square. Let's go. You invited me to this meeting, after all, Asuna said, getting to her feet. He nodded and slowly rose. What was he going to say? It ultimately didn't matter, because she was never going to speak with him again. But the thought dug into her side like a tiny thorn. I want to know. I don't want to know. Even Asuna didn't know which desire was stronger. Chapter 5 44 That was the number of players who gathered at the fountain in Tolbana. I had to admit, it was well below my expectations, my hopes. An official party in SAO could be up to six players, and a throng of eight of those, 48 people in total, was a full-size raid party. My experience in the beta test had taught me that the best way to tackle a floor boss without any casualties was two raid parties trading off, but this wasn't even for one. I sucked in a deep breath for a sigh, but held it when a voice came from behind. There are so many. It was the fencer in the hooded cape. I turned and shot back. Many? You call this many? Yeah, I mean, they're all here for the first attempt on the floor's boss, right? Knowing that they could all die in the process. I see. I nodded and gazed around the small groups of fighters huddled throughout the square. There were five or six players I knew by name, and another fifteen or so were, un were familiar faces I'd come across along the frontier. The remaining twenty-something were all new to me. Naturally, the gender balance was extremely uneven. As far as I could tell, the fencer was the only woman in the group. But with her hood pulled so low, it wasn't quite apparent, and I was certain that anyone else observing would assume it was all men. Across the square, Argo the Rat was perched upon a high wall, but she would not take part in the battle. The fencer was right. They were all going to face the first floor boss, an enemy no one had seen before, at least not in the official Linecrad. Of all the battles one could tackle on the first floor, this would carry the highest risk of death. That meant that every player here was prepared for the possibility of death, in order to serve as a stepping stone for those who came after them. However, I'm not so sure, I muttered. She turned to me, her eyes flashing doubtfully within the hood. I chose my words carefully. I don't think it applies to everyone, but I think a fair number of them aren't doing it out of self-sacrifice, but because they just don't want to be left in the dust. If anything, I'd be one for the later my latter myself. Left in the dust? Behind what? 
behind the frontier. The thought of dying is frightening, but so is the idea that the boss is being defeated without you. The cloth hood dipped slightly. I figured that being a total beginner at MMOs, she wouldn't understand what I was saying, but I was wrong. Is that the same kind of motivation? Like when you don't want to fall below top 10 of the class, or you want to stay above the 17th percentile or whatever? Now it was my turn to lose my voice. Eventually I agreed. Yeah, um, I think so. The shapely lips visible through the hood crinkled to a tiny smile, and I heard a few quiet snorts of breath. Was she laughing? The wielder of that ultra-precise linear who told me to mind my own business when I brought her out of the dungeon? I was almost about to rudely stare directly under the hood, but I was saved from that f fake pass by the sound of loud clapping and a shout that echoed across the square. All right, people. It's five minutes past already, so let's get started. Gather around, folks. You there, three steps closer. The speaker was a swordsman clad in glimmering metal armor. He leapt nimbly up onto the lip of the fountain at the center of the square from a standing position. A single jump of that height wearing heavy armor made it clear that he had excellent strength and agility. Some within the crowd of forty-odd began to stir when he turned to survey the group. It made sense. The man standing on the lip of the fountain was so brilliantly handsome that you, could, that you had to wonder why he would bother playing a VR MMO in the first place. On top of that, the wavy locks framing his face were dyed a brilliant blue. His hair dyed was not sold at NPC vendors on the first floor, so he must have gotten it as a rare drop from a monster. If he'd gone to all that trouble just to look good in front of the crowd, I assumed he must have been disappointed, given that there was only one woman in the group, and it wasn't clear she was one given the hood. But the man flashed a dashing smile that suggested he would never stop to think such a thing. Thank you all for heeding my call today. I'm sure some of you know me already, but just in case, my name's Diavel. And I'd like to think of myself as playing a knight. Those closest to the fountain started jeering and whistling, and some would cried, I bet you wanted to say you're playing a hero. There were no official character classes in Sword Art Online. Every player had a number of skill slots, and they were free to choose which skills to equip in advance. As an example, players who focused on crafting or trading skills might be referred to as blacksmiths, tailors, or cooks, but I'd never heard of anyone calling a knight or a hero. Then again, if someone wanted to be known as that title, that was their prerogative. Diavel had bronze armor on his chest, shoulders, and arms, and shins, as well as a longsword on his waist and a kite shield on his back. Added up, they certainly made a proper knight's outfit. Watching his proud display from the back row, I quickly consulted my memory. The equipment and hair were different, so it was hard to tell, but I could have sworn I'd seen that face a few times before in towns around the first floor. What about before the other Ironcrad? I didn't recognize the name. Now, you're all top players in the game, active around the front line of our progress, and I hardly need remind you that why we're here. Diavel's speech continued. I stopped trying to remember and focused on his words. The blue-haired knight raised a hand and gestured to the massive tower, the labyrinth of the first floor, outside the town limits. Today, our party discovered the staircase that leads to the top of the floor, which means that either tomorrow or the day after, we'll finally reach the first floor boss chamber. The crowd stirred. I was surprised as well. The first floor labyrinth was a 20 levels tower, and I, and the fencer, had been just around the start of the 19th level today. I had no idea that other players mapped so much of the floor already. One month. It took an entire month, but we still have to be an example. We have to beat the boss, reach the second floor, and show everyone back in the town of beginnings that someday we can beat this game of death. That's the duty of all the top level players here. 
Isn't that right? Another cheer rose. Now it wasn't just Yavel's friends, but others in the crowd who applauded. What he said was noble and without fault. In fact, anyone seeking fault in that had to be crazy. I decided the knight who stood up and took the role of uniting the scattered players at the frontier deserved some applause from me when... Hang on just a sec, sir knight, the voice said calmly. The cheers stopped and people at the front stepped aside, standing in the middle of the open space was a short but solid man. All I could see from my position was a large sword and spiky brown hair that conjured the image of a cactus. The cactus stood up, took a step forward, and growled in a rasp totally unlike Diavel's smooth voice. Gotta get this off of my chest before we can play pretend friends. Diavel didn't bat an eye at the sudden interruption. He beckoned to the squat man who, with a confident smile, What's on your mind, friend? I'm open to opinions. If you're going to offer yours, however, I ask you at least introduce yourself first. Hmm. The cactus-headed man snorted, took a few steps forward until he was right in front of the fountain, and then turned to the crowd. The name's Cabal. The spiky-haired man with the fierce name glared out at the gathering with small but piercing eyes. As they swept sideways, I had the fleeting impression that they stopped on my face for a moment. But I'd never heard his name and didn't remember meeting him before. After his lengthy survey of the gathering, Kibao growled again. There gotta be five or ten folks in this myth who, uh, who owe an apology first. Apology to whom? Diavel the Knight. Still standing on the edge of the fountain behind him, grandly gestured with both hands. Kibal spat angrily, not bothering to turn around. Ha! <laughs> Ain't it obvious? To the 2,000 people who already died. 2,000 people died because they hogged everything to themselves. Ain't that right? The murmuring crowd of 40 or so suddenly went dead silent. They finally understood what Kibal was trying to say. I did too. The only sound... Through the heavy silence was the distant strains of the NPC musicians playing the evening BGM. No one said a word. Everyone seemed to understand that if he spoke up, he would be branded one of them. It was certainly that fear which gripped my mind at the moment. Mr. Kibao, when you refer to them, I assume you mean the former beta testers? Asked Dialvel, arms crossed, a look of grave severity on his face. Obviously, Kibal said to the knight behind him with a glance, the thick scale mail skewed to a leather frame jangling as he turned around. The day this goddamn game started, all them beta testers up and ran straight out of the first town. They abandoned 9,000 folks who didn't know right from left. They monopolized all the best hunting spots and profitable quests so they can level up didn't spare a backwards glance for no one. I know there must be more than one or two standing here right now, thinking they can get up in the boss action without anyone knowing. They don't get down on hands and knees to apologize and donate their stockpiles of coal and items for the cause of fighting this boss. I ain't gonna put my life in their hands. That's what I'm saying. Just as the Kiba in his name the word for fangs, suggested. He ended with a snarl of bared teeth. Supr unsurprisingly, no one spoke up. As a former beta tester myself, I clenched my teeth, held my breath, and didn't make a sound. It wasn't as though I didn't want to shout back at him, to ask him if he thought no beta testers had died yet. A week earlier, I bought a piece of intel from Argo, technically. I had her look into something for me. I wanted a total of dead beta testers. The SAO closed beta, which ran during the summer vacation, only had a thousand open slots. Every member also got exclusive first rights to buy the official package edition when it was released. Based on the number of people logged in at the end of the beta, I estimated that not every person was going to keep playing when the game was released. It would probably be seven or eight hundred. That was my guess as to the total number of beta testers present at the start of the game of death. 
finding out who was a beta tester was the tricky part. If there was a thorn mark next to the player's color cursor, that would clear up the matter at once, but fortunately, that was not the case. And physical appearance was not a factor either, as the GM Akihiko Kayaba had ensured that every player was now modeled after their own real-life appearance. The only hint to go on was a player's name, but many of them could have changed names between beta and the full release. The reason Argo and I recognized each other as beta testers had to do with the circumstances of our first meeting, but that's a story for another time. At any rate, Argo's investigation should have been incredibly hard, yet she, come back to, yet she came back to me with a number after just three days. In her estimation, the total number of beta testers who were now dead was about 300. If that figure was correct, it meant that out of the 2,000 people dead, 1,700 were new players. But under percentages, that meant the death rate of new players was 18% but the death rate of beta testers was closer to 40. Knowledge and experience did not always translate to safety. At times, it could be one's downfall. I myself nearly died on the very first quest I followed after the game of death began. There were external factors as well. The terrain, items, monsters were virtually the same in the finished game as the beta, but just the slightest little difference could pop up, as small as deadly, as a poison needle. May I speak? A rich baritone voice echoed throughout the evening square. I looked up with a start to see a silhouette proceeding from the left end of the gathering. He was a large, easily over six feet tall. The avatar's size was supposed to have no effect on stats, but he made the two-handed battle axe strapped to his back look light. His face was just as menacing as the weapon. His scalp was completely bald and chocolate brown, but the chiseled features on his face fit that bold look quite well. He didn't even look Japanese. For all I knew, maybe he was a different race. As the burly man reached the edge of the fountain, he turned and bowed to the crowd of 40 before turning his attention to the woefully outsized Kibao. My name's Agil. If I have this right, Kibao, you're claiming that many newbies died because of the former beta testers didn't help them, and therefore they ought to apologize and pay reparations, is that correct? Y yeah Kibao was momentarily taken aback, but he recovered and stood straight, glaring back at the axe warrior Agil with his glinting eyes. They didn't abandon the rest of us, as 2,000 wouldn't be dead right now. That ain't just 2,000 random folks, that's the best of the best from other MMOs that we lost. Those beta assholes had the decency to share their loot and knowledge, we'd have ten times as many folks here. In fact, we'd be on the second or third floor by now. 300 of the people you're mourning are those assholes, jerk. I wanted to yell, but I held back the impulse. I didn't have any proof backing that number. And in more self-centered terms, I just didn't want to be singled out. This much was clear. Outing myself as a former beta tester could not possibly help my situation. The four or five hundred testers left were hiding among the players new to the game. In terms of level and equipment, they likely weren't any different from the top players. But if I stood up and revealed my background, not only would it fail to smooth over the tensions between the two groups, it would probably just end with a witch hunt. The worst possible outcome was infighting between new, and te new players and testers among the elite players in the frontier. We had to avoid that outcome at all costs. Whether in the field or in the dungeons, the outdoor areas of SAO were free reign for attacking other players. So you claim, Kibao, while I can't argue with the loot, we've been certainly had the information out there. Agil spoke in his rich baritone while I hung my head pathetically. He reached into the pouch on his waist of the leather armor stretched over his rippled muscles and produced a simple book made of bound sheets of parchment. On the cover was a simple rat icon with round ears and three whiskers on either side. You got one of these guidebooks too, didn't you? They were handling them out for free in the item shops in Horunka and Medai. For free? I muttered. 
as the icon in the cover suggested, it was a guide to the area that Argo the Rat sold to other players. It contained detailed maps and lists of monsters, their item drops, and even quest information. The large splash text on the lower half of the cover that said, Don't worry, this is Argo's guidebook. It wasn't just a cheeky bit of fluff. Admittedly, I bought the entire set myself to keep my memory fresh, but from what I recalled, they went for a hefty price of 5,000 coal per book. I got one too, the hit hair toe silence fencer whispered. When I asked if it had been for free, she nodded. It was stocked at the item store for on consignment, but the price was listed as zero coal, so everyone took one. It was really helpful. But what the hell? The rat. A scheming dealer who had who would sell her own status numbers for the right price, giving away information for free? It was unthinkable. I shot a glance back at the stone wall where she'd been sitting minutes ago, but there was no one there. I made a mental note to ask her for the reason the next time I saw her, and then reconsidered I heard her voice inside my head saying, That'll cost you a thousand, dig? Yeah, I got one. What of it? Kibal snarled, bringing me back to the present scene. Ego put the strategy guide back in his pouch and crossed his arms. Every time I reached a new town or village, there was always one of these books in the item shop. Same for you, right? Didn't it strike you as too quick for the information to have been compiled already? What's the point if it's too quick? I mean, only the people who could have offered this information and map data to the informer are the beta testers. The crowd stirred. Kibal's mouth shut, and Dialvel the Knight nodded in agreement. Ego looked at the group again and spoke in his loud baritone. Listen, the information was out there, and yet people still died. I'm thinking it's because they were veteran MMO players. They assumed that SAO worked on the same principles and standards as other titles, failed to pull back when they needed to. But now is not the time to be holding anyone responsible for this. It seems to me that this meeting is going to determine whether we meet the same fate or not. Ego the Axe Warrior's tone was bold but reasonable, and his argument was so sound that Kibao had no immediate retort. If anyone other than Egil had argued the same thing, Kibao would likely have accused him of being a beta tester himself, but in this case, he could only stare daggers at the large man. Behind the two silent debaters standing on the edge of the fountain with his long flowing hair almost purple in the light of the sitting setting sun, Dialvel nodded magna... Magnemoniously. Your point is well taken, Kibao. I myself nearly died on several occasions due to my ignorance of the wilderness. But as Egil says, isn't this the time to look forward? If we're going to beat the floor boss, we'll even need the former testers. No, especially need the former testers. If we exclude them and get wiped out, then what's the point of it all? It was a sweeping speech more than worthy of a noble knight. Many of the crowd nodded in agreement. As the mood seemed to tilt towards forgiveness for the testers, I sighed with relief and not a small amount of shame. Diavel continued. I'm sure you all have your own thoughts on the matter, but for now, I would like to help in clearing the first floor. If you simply can't bear the thought of fighting alongside beta testers, then we'll miss you, but I won't force you to participate. Teamwork is the most important part of any raid. His gaze slowly swept across the crowd until it fixed on Kibal. The cactus-headed swordsman met his gaze for several long moments. Then he snorted loudly and growled, Fine, I'll play along for now. But once the boss fight's over, we're going to settle this once and for all. He turned, scale mail rattling, and walked back to the front row of the crowd. Egil spread his hands, signaling he had nothing else to say, and returned to his spot. In the end, this scene was the highlight of the meeting. There's only so much detailed planning to be done before a battle. We'd all just reached the floor the creature was on. How does anyone plan a boss fight when no one's even seen it yet? Well, that wasn't quite true. I knew that the first floor boss was an enormous kobold, that he swung a huge talwar, and that he was accompanied by a retinue of about 12 heavily armored kobolds. 
If I revealed that I was a former beta tester and offered my knowledge to the boss, our odds of success might rise. But if I did that, people would ask why I hadn't spoken up before, and it might inflame the undercurrent of anger against the testers again. Plus, my knowledge was only of the previous incarnation of Aincrad, and there was always the possibility that the release version of SAO had a redesigned and rebalanced boss. If we formulated a plan based on the beta information and charged into the room only to find it had a different appearance and pattern of attack, the ensuing confusion would be the downfall of the raid. Ultimately, until someone opened the door to the boss chamber and got him to pop up into the world, we couldn't begin to plan. This was the excuse I told myself to hold my silence. At the end of the meeting, Diavel led an optimistic cheer and got the rest of the gathering to shout in approval. I raised a fist in solidarity, but the Vincer beside me did not even pull a hand out of her cape, much less join in the cheer. She turned around to leave even before the call of dismissed rang out. Before she went, she spoke in a whisper that only I could hear. Whatever you were about to say before the meeting, tell me, if we both survive the battle. As she headed into a dim alley, I silently answered. Yes, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I left everything else behind for the sake of keeping myself alive. Chapter 6 There was no discussion of any strategic merit at the meeting, but it had apparently served the valuable purpose of bolstering morale, as the 20th level of the labyrinth was mapped with unprecedented speed. On Saturday, December 30th, the day after the meeting, the first party, again Diavel's band of six, discovered the double doors to the boss chamber. I knew when it happened because I was solo adventuring nearby and heard the cheers. Boldly enough, they opened the door to catch a glimpse of the resident within. At the fountain side meeting in Tulbana that evening, the blue-haired knight proudly announced his findings. The boss was an enormous kobold that towered over six feet tall. His name was Ilfang the Kobold Lord and his weapon fell into a curved blade category. He was attended by three ruined kobold sentinels with metal armor and halberds. This much was the same as the beta. From what I recall, the sentinels respawned each time the four stages of the boss's HP bar, making a total of 12 over the course of the battle. So, as usual, I didn't have the guts to say this out loud. It would become clear as they tried to f a few test skirmishes, I told myself, as it turned out, I needn't haven't worried, because something cleared it all up in the midst of the meeting. Coincidentally, the NPC shop stall in the corner of the fountain square began selling a familiar item. Three sheets of parchment bound together, more of a pamphlet than a book. It was Argo's first floor boss guidebook. Price, zero coal. The meeting was temporarily adjourned so that everyone could purchase a copy from the NPC and pour over the contents. As usual, the amount of information was impressive. The first three pages were stuffed with all manner of details. The just, re the just revealed boss's name, estimated HP, the reach and speed of its talwar, damage, even sword skills. The fourth page covered the accompanying kobold sentinels, including a note that they spawned four times, making a total of twelve. On the rear cover of the book was a message in red, red font that had not been present on any of Argo's other guidebooks. It read, This information is from the SAO beta test. Details may not match the current version of the game. When I saw this, I looked up searching for Argo around the square, but I saw no sign of the rat or her plain leather armor today. I looked back and down and murmured, She's really going out on a limb. This red warning was going to topple Argo's usual stance of, this is just information I bought from some former beta tester, Identity Unknown. Anyone who read this warning would suspect that the rat herself was a former tester. There was no proof, of course, but with the widening gap in sentiment between the new players and the beta testers, she was clearly putting herself at risk of being the first hunted down. On the other hand, it was clear that this guidebook would remove the need for tiresome and dangerous scouting missions. Once all 40-plus players had finished reading, they looked once again to the blue-haired knight, standing on the lip of the fountain, as though putting their decision in the hands of a leader. 
Diavel's head stayed down for many long seconds, deep in thought, before he finally straightened up and addressed the crowd. Let us be grateful for this information, my friends, the crowd murmured. This was clearly a call for peace with the beta testers rather than antagonism. I thought Kibao might leap up to protest, but the brown cactus-haired man near the front of the gathering stayed firmly in place. Regardless of its source, this guide is going to save us two or three days of scouting on the boss. I'm actually quite grateful for this. It's the reconnaissance missions that carry the greatest risk of fatalities, after all. Heads of various colors nodded throughout the square. If these figures are correct, the boss's numerical stats aren't too dangerous. If SAO was a normal VR MMO, we could probably take out take it out with an average level three no five levels below the enemies. So if we work on our tactics and come equipped with plenty of pots for healing, it should be possible to win without any deaths. No, let me rephrase that. We're not gonna have any deaths, period. On my pride as a knight, I swear this to you. Someone in the crowd raised a cheer. And a round of applause followed. Even as a twisted solo, I had to admit that Diavel had a gift for leadership. The guild function didn't unlock until the third floor, but he would certainly have his own one day. But my breath caught in my throat at his next words. All right, now I think it's time to actually start planning out the battle. After all, we can't start taking roles until we formed a proper raiding party. First off, form into parties with your friends and others around you. What? He sounded like a PE teacher at an elementary school. I did some quick calculations. A full party of SAO was six members, and there were 44 present, so that made seven parties with two left over. Should we shoot for average and have four parties of six, or four parties of five? But that was unlikely to happen on its own if our leader didn't make the order. All of my high-speed thinking went to waste. In less than a minute of Diavel's suggestion, there was seven full parties of six members each. Obviously, he already had his own party of six. But I didn't expect lone wolves like Kibao and Agil to find their own grouping so fast. I began to wonder if I was seriously the only person who didn't receive some kind of invitation. But I wasn't. After a quick scan of the crowd, I spotted a familiar hooded cape standing slightly apart from the rest, and I slipped over to her side. So you got left out too, huh? I asked, only to be greeted with a stare like molten steel. She muttered an angry response. I'm not a cast-off. I just didn't want to butt in. It seemed like everybody else already had their own friends. I wisely decided not to point out that she had perfectly defined a cast-off, and put on a serious face instead. Why don't you team up with me then? Raid group goes into eight parties, so it's the only way we can participate. Basing my suggestion on the properties of the game system was a success, as she looked briefly hesitant, then snorted and said, I might consider it if you send me the invite. Since retorting, it was my idea first, so you should send the invite, was the kind of childishness that I grew up out of that I grew out of since being trapped here in the last month. I nodded obediently and trapped, tapped the fencer's cursor, sending a party invite. She accepted flippantly, and a second, smaller HP gauge appeared on the left side of my field of vision. I stared at the list of letters below the bar. Asuna. That was the name of the strange fencer with the paternal... Ugh. Preternatural, yeah, that's a weird word to say. Hold on. <laughs> that was the name of the strange fencer with the preternaturally swift linear. Dialvel, the knight's leadership, was not limited to his speech making. He examined each of the seven full parties that had been formed, and with the minimum of switching members, had tweaked them into distinct groups with their own purpose in the battle. There were two heavily armored tank squads, three groups of attackers with high offensive power, and two support teams armed with lower, with longer range weapons. The two tank squads would switch off, pulling aggro from the kobold lord, absorbing his attacks and attention. 
Two of the attack teams would focus on the boss, while the third was in charge of holding off his followers. The support teams, equipped with long shafted weapons, would employ delaying and interrupting skills as much as possible to prevent the enemies from attacking. I thought it was a good arrangement, simple and less likely to fall apart. The knight returned my esteem by examining the leftover party, the fencer and I, of course, for a few long moments before offering some pleasant advice. Can you folks back up Team E to make sure none of the roaming kobolds get through? Translated, it felt like he was asking if we could hang out near the back and not get in anyone's way. I could sense the fencer named Asuna preparing to make a very unfriendly gesture, so I held out a hand in front of her and smiled. Got it. That's an important role. You can count on us. Thanks a lot. The knight flashed his pearly whites and returned to the fountain. The angry voice hissed in my ear. How is that important? We're not even getting a single hit on the boss before it dies. Well, what else can we do? There's only two of us. We can't even switch in and last long enough for pot rotation. Switch? Pot? At her mistrustful murmuring, I stopped to consider. She had left the town of beginnings as an absolute newbie with no prior experience and made it this far on her own. Using nothing more than a bundle of five baseline rapiers bought from an NPC and the sword skill linear. I'll explain everything later. It'll take too long to go over right near. I figured there was more than likely a chance she'd shoot back that she didn't need to know anyway. But to my surprise, she was silent for several moments before nodding meekly. The second meeting of the boss strategy committee ended with quick greetings from the leaders of teams A through G and an official distribution plan from the cash and items the boss would drop. The large axe warrior Agil was the leader of the tank team B, while the antagonistic Kibal led attack team E. The E team was the group assigned to stop the roving kobolds, so as the leftovers. It was our job to assist Kibal. I didn't really want anything to do with him, but he didn't actually know that I was a former tester, for now. In the end, Argo the Rat never showed up to the meeting. I wasn't going to blame her, of course. Her guidebook was more than enough help. The coal dropped by the boss would be automatically split evenly between all 44 members of the raid, and the items were on a simple finder's keepers basis. Contemporary MMOs had transitioned to a system in which players had could elect to claim an item and roll dice to see who would win it, but SAO chose a more primitive method. The items would automatically drop into a player's storage and no one would be any the wiser. In other words, if the group decided that all items from the boss should be distributed by dice rolls, all players would have to voluntarily give up those items to the lottery first. As I knew from personal experience in the beta, this was a sore test of one's willpower. Several times I'd experienced the nasty breakup of a party when no one stepped forward with their loot after a big fight, meaning that someone must be lying about their gains. was likely Diavel's intention to prevent this unsavory outcome by enacting the Finder's Keeper's Rule, our considerate knight in shining armor. At 5.30, like the day before, we closed with cheer and the gathering broke apart into small groups to find pubs and restaurants to visit. I rolled my shoulders, which seemed unnaturally stiff, wondering if it was just an illusion or some kind of actual physical tension that was bleeding through to this virtual world. So. Where will you be giving me this explanation? I wondered what she was talking about for a moment, then spun around in a nervous surprise. Oh, I I can talk anywhere you like. How about a pub around here? No, I don't want anyone seeing. I was briefly stung by her implication, but recovered my pride by choosing to interp interpret her meaning as seen with a man rather than just seen with me. Okay, how about an NPC's house? But still, someone could wander in. We could get a room at an inn so we could lock the door, but that's obviously out. Of course it is. This time I suffered piercing damage from that retort, which was as sharp as the end of her rapier. I could manage a conversation with a female player because this was a virtual world, but just a month before I had been terribly awkward and antisocial middle schooler who could barely talk to his own sister. 
Wasn't I supposed to be sticking out my guns here as a solo player? Why was I in this situation in the first place? Obviously, I wouldn't be any use in a boss battle without joining a group, but the other seven groups were all men, so I'd have felt much less awkward if I just worked my way in with them instead. As my mind ran in ever more self-pitying circles, the fencer sighed and continued. Besides, the in-rooms in this place barely live up to the name. They're like tiny boxes with a bed and table. And they expect you to pay 50 coal a night? I don't care about food, but the sleep you need is real. So they could at least give us better accommodations. Huh? You think so? I asked, surprised. You know there are better places available if you search them out, right? They just cost a little bit more. How hard do you have to search? There are only three inns in town, and they're all the same. I finally understood. Oh, I see. You only check the places within the big inn signs, right? Well, isn't that self-explanatory? An inn's an inn. Yeah, but the only... That only refers to the cheapest possible places to spend the night here in the ground floor. The inns aren't the only places to, s to pay coal for a room, though. Her lips suddenly pursed. W well, why didn't you say that earlier? She shot back. I knew I had the upper hand now, so I proudly described my favorite spot in town. I stay on the second floor of a farm in, in town for 80 a night. But it comes with all the milk you want, has a comfy, spacious bed, and a nice view, not to mention the bath. At the last phrase, she struck with the speed of the linear I had seen deep in the dungeon. Her hand leapt out and grabbed the collar of my gray coat, almost hard enough to set off the game's anti-crime code. Her voice was steely and menacing. What did you just say? Chapter 7 As she'd mentioned earlier, it was Asuna's belief that out of all the actions possible in this virtual world, the only real one was sleep. Everything else was a sham. Walking, running, talking, eating, and fighting. All of these things were simple digital codes sent to and from the Sword Art Online server. Nothing the in-game avatar did caused a single twitch of a finger on the real-life body, reclining in bed. The only exception occurred when the avatar lay down for the night, and the real brain engaged in what must be sleep. So, above anything else, she wanted to make sure she got a good night's sleep at the inns in town. It proved to be harder than it seemed. The constant stress and rhythm of battle in the wilderness and dungeons left no time for reflection, but when she returned to town and lay in bed, she fell into an endless replay of her actions from a month before. Why had she indulged in such a strange whim that day? Why wasn't she satisfied just by touching the nerve gear? Why did she put the formidable headgear on and say, Link, start? Whenever she felt a light sleep reflecting on, the, on that particular regret, she had nightmares. It was a crucial time for her, the winter of her third and final year of middle school. And because of this stupid game, Austin's classmates were no doubt laughing at her failure. Her relatives were pitying her for falling off the career path that had years left to pay out. But worst of all, her parents, staring down at her comatose body in some hospital room, their faces hidden. She'd twitch and wake up with a soft jolt, and then check the clock in the lower left corner of her vision to find that, at best, she'd only been asleep for three hours. After that, no amount of lying in bed with her eyes closed would bring sleep back. In a way, if she'd just been able to get a good night's sleep, Asuna wouldn't have driven herself to, to that punishing dungeon crawls for three or four days at a time. So as the coal piled up in her purse, Asuna wished more and more for a nice room and a bed to spend it on. The ends in this world were cramped and dim, and whatever material the beds were made from, they were noisy and tough. She didn't need Italian-made, high-resistance polyurethane foam, but... Maybe simple latex would at least lengthen her rest from three hours to four, and beyond that, a bathtub, or at least a shower, would be nice. As far as bathing went, her real-life body was almost certainly being regularly cleaned at the hospital, but this was an issue of comfort, 
She was ready to die along, alone in a dungeon, if that's what it came to, but if she could just have the chance, just once, to stretch her legs and soak in a nice hot bath. This fervent wish shot to the forefront of her mind at the black-haired swordsman's words. What did you just say? Osna repeated, not realizing she'd grabbed him by the collar. Unless she'd just suffered some hallucination, she could have sworn he'd just said, All the milk you can drink? After that. Comfy, spacious bed and a nice view? After that. With a bath? So she hadn't misheard. Osna let go of his coat and continued flustered. You said this room was 80 coal a night? I, I did. How many extra rooms does this inn have? Where is it? I'll take a room. Just show me the way. Finally, she seemed to understand the situation. He coughed and solemnly stated, Um, well, I told you I was renting out the second floor, right? You did. What I meant was I'm renting out the entire second floor. There are no open rooms, and they didn't have any rent on the first floor. What? She had to hold her feet firm to keep from slumping to her knees. Then the room's all... She, he seemed to understand what she was trying to ask, and responded regretfully, his eyes wandering. Well, I, I've gotten a good week's worth of enjoyment out of the place, so I'd love to switch with you, but I actually bought the maximum length of stay in advance, which is uh, ten days, and the transaction can't exactly be cancelled. What? Again, she nearly flopped over, but held her ground. Austin was terribly conflicted. He just told her that there were places to stay aside from the inns, and some were much nicer. Therefore, if she searched around Tolbana, perhaps there would be another spot with a bath. But on the other hand, there were currently several dozen players around town for the purpose of beating the floor boss. Most likely, any nicer room would already be taken, which was no doubt the reason he'd reserve his for such a lengthy stay. Should she try checking at the last town before this? But the fields around here were full of dangerous beasts after sundown. And they were meeting at the fountain at ten in the next morning. She wasn't all that jazzed up about this group effort to fight the boss. But now that she was participating, however marginally, she was not going to show up late or skip it entirely. That left only one option. For several seconds, Asuna's body and soul were a battleground of conflicting desires. She would never in a million years consider this option in the real world, but everything here was only digital data. Not real, including her own avatar. And this was no longer a total stranger. They'd shared a bread with cream. They were taking on the same role as the boss battle, and hang on. Sorry, that was an alarm. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me rewind that a bit. They'd shared bread with cream, they were taking on the same role in the boss battle, and hang on, hadn't he just said he was going to explain something to her earlier? That explanation would serve a good excuse, right? Of course. The swordsman was still studi studiously looking everywhere but at Asuna when she lowered her head and said in a voice barely loud enough to reach his ears, Let me use your bath. The farm at which the swordsman was staying was at the edge of a small field on the east of Tolbana. The building was much larger than she expected. The combined size of the stable and the house itself might even be as large as Austin's house in the real life. A pristine stream ran through a corner of the plot of land, pushing a small water wheel with pleasant creeks. The two-story house was occupied on the first floor by an NPC farming family. When Asuna stepped through the front door, the farmer's wife flashed her a beaming smile. She couldn't help but notice the grandmother snoozing in a rocking chair next to the fire had a golden exclamation mark over her head, a sign of a quest, but decided to let it pass for now. The swordsman led her up a set of heavy stairs to a short hallway with a single door at the end. He touched the knob and it opened automatically with the clicking sound effect of a lock unlatching. If Asuna had touched it, nothing would have happened. Even lockpicking skills had no effect on the door to a room rented by a player. Um, well, come on in. He pushed the door open and gestured her in awkwardly. 
Thanks, she said quietly and took a step inside, and then screamed. What the? It's so big, and, and this is only 30 coal more expensive than the place I'm renting? It's so cheap. Being able to find spots like this is a special skill. It's just not on your character sheet. Of course, in my case, he stopped mid-sentence. She looked at him curiously, but he merely shook his head. Asuna gave the room another once-over inside. The room they were standing in now had to be at least 300 square feet. If the door on the wall led to the bedroom, it must be about the same size. On the west wall was another door with a placard reading bathroom on it. The oddly decorative script seemed to have a sorcerous suction to it, drawing Asuna closer. While the design of the place was rustic, it was very comfortable and homey. The swordsman removed his sword and boots and sank into the cushy sofa. After a luxurious stretch, he looked up as though the system remembering Asuna was there. And coughed awkwardly. Um, well, <clears throat> as you can see, the bathroom is uh, that way, so uh, be, be, be my guest. Uh, th thanks. It felt a bit rude to visit someone's room and plunge right into the bath, but it was far too late to observe restraint now. She accepted his offer and was heading for the door when his voice drifted over her shoulder. Oh, uh, just so you're aware, bathing isn't quite the same as in real life. The nerve gear doesn't handle liquid sensations all that well, so just, uh, don't expect too much. As long as there's plenty of hot water, I'm not asking for anything more. She said, on, she said in all honesty, and opened the bathroom door. She slid inside and pulled the knob shut behind her. Except for maybe a lock, she thought. Alas, when she turned around to check, her wish was unfulfilled. There were no buttons or latches around the door. She tried tapping the door just in case, but as she wasn't the current owner of the room, Asuna could not call up the menu. On the other hand, at this point, the presence of, or absence of, a lock was largely irrelevant. She was already in the bathroom of a boy she'd met just yesterday, about to use his tub. A black-haired swordsman, whose name she still didn't know, was hard to gauge in terms of personality and age, but he was not the kind of person to barge into a bathroom without warning, she thought. And if he did try, there were within the limits of towns, which meant the anti-crime code was in effect. Asuna tore her gaze away from the door and looked to the south. Wow, she murmured. Even the bathroom was large. The northern half was the changing area, complete with a thick, soft carpet and shelves of untreated wood on the walls. The southern half was polished stone tile, most of which was covered by a large white bathtub in the shape of a boat. High on the brick wall was a faucet in the shape of a monstrous face, and clear liquid was shooting out of it with terrific force. Hot water and its thick white steam filled the bathtub up to a vi the very lip and cascaded onto the tile floor, where it ran down into the drain on the corner. Common sense said there was no way the medieval European manners this building was modeled after contained such deluxe hot water plumbing. Asuna was not going to fault the design and accuracies of this virtual world, however. Weak need, she'd opened her menu window and hit the equipment removal button on the mannequin that took up the right half of the screen. All the things she'd been wearing for days and weeks, the hooded cape, the bronze armor that covered her chest, the long gloves and boots, and the rapier at her waist, disappeared instantly, and her long chestnut hair fell across her back. All that remained were the woolen three-quarter sleeve tunic and the tight leather pants. The equipment button now read, Remove All Clothes. So she pressed it again. The top and bottom disappeared, leaving only two pieces of simple underwear. Asuna gave the door another quick glance, then pressed the button one last time, which now read, Remove All Underwear. With just three button presses, her virtual avatar was completely unequipped, and she felt a chill on her virtual skin. The floating castle, with the odd name of Einkrad, did seem to follow the concept of seasons, and the room was quite chilly, in keeping with the early December date. She quickly crossed the room and straddled the ceramic tub, where her left foot sank into the water. The sensory signals hit her brain like a wall. 
She stuck her head into the flow of water from the faucet, resisting the urge to slide entirely under the surface just yet. Only when the warmth covered her entire body and took the chill of the air off did she slip into the hot water on her back and splash. <sighs> there was no holding in that sigh of contentment. As the black-haired swordsman had wa warned her, it wasn't a perfect representation of a bath. Most of the details were just slightly off. The connection between skin and water, the pressure on the body, the glimmering reflection of light on the underside of the face. But, as with eating, there was enough present, bathing sensation, programmed into the system for her to be able to close her eyes, stretch her limbs, and relax. It was a bath. And not just any bath, but a deluxe one nearly six feet long and full to the brim. She sank in up to her lips, closed eyes, letting every muscle relax, and thought, I can die happy now. I have no regrets left. Ever since she had left the town of beginnings two weeks earlier, Asuna's thoughts had followed one stark philosophy. As long as this deadly game was effectively impossible to beat, all 10,000 players would eventually die. In a world where everything was false, dying sooner or later made no difference. In which case, she'd rather keep moving forward as fast as she could until she could no longer go on. At the strategy meeting the last two days, Asuna had observed the scene with cold disinterest. Who was a former beta tester, whatever that was? How the loot would be dis, dis, how the loot would be distributed? These things didn't matter. Tomorrow morning, they would attempt the greatest challenge on the first floor of Einkrad, which had already claimed two thousand victims. A mere forty-something people would never overcome such a hurdle on the first try. There was a very high possibility that they would all die if they didn't retreat to ignoble defeat first. The reason Asuna was so willing to go out of her normal comfort zone with this bath was because she wanted one more before she died. Now that her wish had been fulfilled, she was completely prepared to disappear from this world forever at tomorrow's boss battle. That black bread with the cream on top. What I wouldn't give for one more of those before I die. Asuna was disturbed by the desire that suddenly rose within her. She opened her eyes and sat up slightly. That flavor wasn't bad, but it was an absolute fake. It was a polygonal model attached to some simple variables that dictated its taste, but, but then, the same could be said of this bath. What looked a lot like hot water was simply an in-game boundary with transparency and refraction numbers calculated to look real. The warmth that enveloped her body was just a string of numbers being sent to her brain by the nerve gear. But, but, even back in the real world, the world in which she'd lived her entire life up to a month before, had she ever wanted to eat something as badly as she did now? Had she ever wanted to take a bath as badly as she did before this very moment? The full course menus of organic food that she'd dutifully but mechanically eaten as her parents commanded, or the virtual roll of her bread over, or over her body, craved so much it made her drool. Which was the real thing? Sensing that she was considering something very, very important, Asuna held her breath. I need some water before we get to chapter 8. Water! I don't know if you can tell, but my throat is starting to hurt. Chapter 8. 
Who knew that just keeping my glance from drifting towards the bathroom door required such a difficult saving throw against temptation? I was lying deep in the sofa, training all day of my constant training all of my concentration on the copy of Argo's first floor boss guidebook I'd received earlier that day. But no matter how many times my, my eyes passed over the simple, easy-to-read font, none of the contents stuck in my mind. Well, it's still better than it would be in real life. Let's say this was at my house in Kawagoe. Kawagoe. Saitsuma. And my mother and sister were away, and a female classmate of mine came in to take a bath for some reason. What would I do? The answer was obvious. I'd silently sneak out of the front door, hop onto my beloved mountain bike, and take off down Prefectural Route 51 toward Arakawa. Instead, fortunately, I was upstairs in a large farmhouse on the outskirts of Tolbana, on the first floor of the floating castle Einkrad, and I was not a geeky teenage MMO fanatic but Kirito the Swordsman. As long as my body was the virtual avatar, nothing would happen to me. Even after Austin of the Fencer exited from the bathroom, of course, there was always the possibility that this was a clever trap, and that while I was taking my bath, she'd empty the chest in this main room and disappear. But the most she'd find in there were some low-level ingredients from wimpy monsters. In fact, there was no need to take my turn after her. She'd emerge, and I'd say, good luck tomorrow, and send her on her way. The end. I shook my head rapidly and was setting the guidebook down on the coffee table when I heard something. There was a rhythmic sound at the door. To the hallway, not to the bathroom. Someone was knocking. But it was not the, fam not the farmer's wife. That particular rhythm was the signature of someone else. I leapt up from a start and nervously turned around to stare in the direction of the thick oak door and the person standing on the other side, Argo the Rat. Out the south-facing window, into the front yard, onto the donkey tied up outside the stable, then down the path, through the forest, and to the labyrinth, the thought occurred to me, however briefly, but riding mounts in SAO were an extremely difficult task. They would behave better as a riding skill increased, but I didn't have a slot space to waste a hobby skill like that. Instead, I hopped off the sofa and went to check on the bathroom. Lady Asuna would be in the midst of her luxurious bath right now. If Argo caught even a hint of this fact, there would be a new piece of information in her book of secrets. Kirito is the kind of man who entices a girl into his bathroom on their first meeting. I couldn't possibly serve as a model for solo players if news like that got out. But fortunately, all the doors in the world were totally soundproof, with certain exceptions. As far as I knew, there were only three things that could travel through a door. Shouts, knocks, and battle sound effects. Normal conversations and the sounds of the bath would not leak through, even with an ear to the door. So I could let someone into the room, and they would have no idea that anyone was bathing in the tub. And if the fencer happened to open the door while Argo was here... Well, there was always the donkey. The above thoughts flashed through my brain as quick as combat reactions, and I approached the hallway door, steeled myself, and opened it. Once I confirmed who it was, I gave her my prepared line. Strange for you to come visit my room directly. Argo the Rat's whiskers drawn face looked suspicious for a moment, and then shrugged. I guess. Client says I have to get an answer out of you before the end of the day. She strode comfortably across the room and thumbed down the exact spot on the sofa I had just been using. I closed the door and turned the tray to the corner to pour two glasses of fresh milk on the large pitcher there, very carefully keeping myself from glancing at the bathroom door as I returned to the sofa and set the milk on the table. Argo raised an eyebrow and smirked. Seems almost too considerate for you, key boy. S slipped a little sleeping powder in there, did you? You know that stuff doesn't work on players. Even if it did, we're inside town limits. Argo paused for a moment to reflect, then admitted I had a point. 
She raised the glass and downed the entire thing in one swallow. That was good. Pretty high taste settings for being all you can drink. Think you could bottle it up and sell it? Unfortunately, that's only valid for five minutes after leaving the building. Even worse, it doesn't just disappear. It turns absolutely disgusting. Oh, I didn't know that. Nothing scarier than free food. I kept praying that she'd get to the damn point, but there was no telling what would happen when she sensed my impatience. With a straight face, I picked up the guidebook I'd left on the table and smacked it. Speaking of free stuff, what about this? Now I'm a happy customer of your work, but I was buying these books for 500 coal each. <laughs> then at yesterday's meeting, Eagle the Axe Warrior says you're giving them out for free? I said sourly. She hissed with laughter. It was thanks to you and the f other front runners purchasing the first batch that I was able to make a second printing distribute for free. But don't worry, all the first printings have authentic Argo signature inside. I see. Well, that's a great reason to keep buying. This free distribution must have been Argo's way of taking responsibility for her beta, te beta tester background. I wanted to open up and ask her about it directly, but even between us, there was an unspoken taboo about discussing the beta. Plus, as a former tester who'd never lifted a finger to help the player population, I didn't have the right to ask. Argo swung her broken brown cool curls and cut down the heavy silence. Well, do you mind if I cut to the chase? Please, 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 I silently screamed, nodding politely. As you can probably guess from the fact that I mentioned a client, this regards the potential buyer of your sword. If you accept today, the offer will be 39,800 coal. 39? I nearly screamed, but held it in. After a deep breath and several seconds, I finally spoke. I don't mean to disrespect you, but are you sure this isn't a scam of some kind? 40,000 coal is more than this weapon is worth. The basic annual blade costs about 15,000 coal, right? With another 20,000, you can buy all the materials to augment it up plus six without any trouble. Might take a little time, but with just 35,000 coal, you could get the same weapon as mine. I said the exact same thing three times, just to be sure. Argo spread her hands, a rare expression of disbelief on her face. I crossed my arms and leaned back into the sofa, all thought of the situation in the bathroom forgotten now, as this new topic demanded my attention. The idea of losing money from the situation burned me up inside, but I felt worse letting my curiosity go unanswered. It took an act of will to make a counteroffer to Eincrad's first information dealer. Argo, I'll pay 1,500 coal for the name of your client. Check with the other side if they see they'll add that. All right, Argo nodded, opening her window and sh shooting off an instant message with fingers flying. With the response arrived a minute later, she twitched an eyebrow and shrugged broadly. It says they don't mind telling you. I was now thoroughly baffled, but I opened my window, window and extracted 1,500 coal anyway, stacking the six coins on the table in front of Argo. She grabbed them and flipped them one by one into strange, into storage with her thumb, nodding to signal the completion of the deal. Actually, Keyboy, you already know his face and name. Qu caused quite a scene at the strategy meeting yesterday. You mean, Kibao? I whispered. She nodded. Kibao, the man who burned with righteous fury toward former beta testers, was the one paying 40000 for my sword? I didn't recall that the weapon hanging across his back was one-handed sword, just like mine, but yesterday was the first time we'd been face to face. And it was over a week ago that Argo had brought the first offer from this particular client to me. The information that I'd paid 1500 coal for left me even more confused than before. I crossed my legs on the cushion to think over this development. Just to be certain, Argo asked me, I take it there'll be no deal on the sword again? Nope. I was not going to part ways with my favorite sword for any sum of money. I nodded my assertion and sensed the rat getting to her feet. Well, I better be off then. Make good use of that guide, you hear? Yeah. Oh, and before I go, I'm going to borrow you the room. 
got changed into my night equipment. Yeah. As I scanned my memory, I did recall that when Kibao had stood in front of the crowd and glared at everyone, his eyes stopped on me for a moment. Did that mean he wasn't suspecting me of being a beta tester, but that he was scoping out my sword? Or could it be both? Hang on a second. What did Argo just say? I looked up, 80% of my mind still concentrating on the topic of Kibao. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Argo turning the doorknob, not, not the main door to the upstairs hallway or the bedroom door at the east hall, the one beneath the plate properly claiming bathroom. As I watched, stunned, the rat disappeared into the bathroom. Three seconds later. Whoa! A tremendous scream shook the building. The next thing I saw was a player that was not Argo bursting out of the door. No memory remains of what happened next. Chapter 9 10 a.m. Sunday, December 4th The name... The game had launched at 1 o'clock p.m. on Sunday, November 6th. So in three hours, it would be exactly four weeks since it all began. When I first noticed the lack of logout button, I assumed it was simply a system error, or at worst, it would be a matter of minutes before order was restored and I could leave. But before long, Akihiko Kaiba, is in the guise of a faceless GM, assigned us to the task of clearing all 100 floors of Aingrad. At the time, I foresaw an imprisonment lasting a hundred days. In essence, I expected that we'd average a floor a day. Now it had been almost four entire weeks, and we hadn't even finished the first floor yet. I could only laugh at how optimistic I'd been. And depending on the outcome of today's boss battle, it could become brutally clear that time wasn't the real issue with our escape. The 44 players in the Fountain Square of Tolbana were the best of the best in the game at that present time. If this squad fell entirely, or even lost half of its members, the news would spread throughout the floor, and the prevailing view would form. SAO was unbeatable. No one could say how long it would take for a second raid party to be formed. There might never be another attempt at the boss. Even grinding for levels wasn't an option. But the effective experience gained from the monsters on the first floor had long passed its peak. Everything rode on whether or not the stats of Ilfane the Kobold Lord, boss monster of the first floor, had been altered since the beta. If the King of the Kobolds was only as tough as I remembered him being, it shouldn't be impossible to get through the fight without any fatalities. Even with our limited levels and equipment, it just depended on whether or not everyone could remain calm and perform their duties knowing their lives were on the line. My brain overheating with all of that mental calculation, I looked to the player at my side, took a short breath, and let out with an awkward smile. Asuna the fencer's side profile, half hidden by her deep hood, seemed no different from the time I'd first seen her in the labyrinth, two mornings before. It was both as fleeting and fragile as a shooting star, and sharp as a needle. Compared to her calm manner, I was a nervous wreck. I continued staring until she suddenly turned and shot me a cold glare. What are you looking at? She whispered, voice quiet but full of menace. I sh shook my head rapidly. She'd warned me this morning that if I so much as recalled the reason why she was furious, she'd force feed me an entire barrel of sour milk. Whatever happened, it was a blank blur in my mind. N nothing I tried to say nonchalantly. She flicked me another glare as sharp as the tip of her rapier and turned away. I began to wonder if this foul mood might affect today's battle. True, no one else was relying upon us for help. We were practically extras, but still. Hey, came a decidedly unfriendly voice from behind. I spun around. A man with short brown hair, fashioned into spikes, stood before me. I flinched backwards. Of all people, I expected Mike talked to me today. Kibao was the last. I stood there dumbfounded. He glared at me and growled. Now listen. And listen good. Y'all stay in the back today. Don't forget your role. You're our party support, nothing more. 
I was already quiet by nature, but no one could have come up with a better response. This was the man who tried to buy my weapon for 40,000 coal yesterday and hired an agent to ensure his identity stayed hidden, both of which failed spectacularly. Typically, a person under those embarrassing and awkward circumstances would rather stay at least 50 feet away from me, but Kibao's attitude seemed to suggest that I ought to feel intimidated. He sneered at me arrogantly one more time and spat, Be a good little boy and pick off the spare kobold scraps we dropped from the table. And with a glob of spittle on the ground for a final flourish, Kibao turned on his heel and strode back to his party. I was still staring in a dull amazement when a voice beside me snapped me back to my wits. What's up with him? It was Asuna, the other half of y'all. Her stare was about 30% scarier than the one that had just been fixed on me. I d don't know. Guess he thinks solo players shouldn't get full of themselves. I murmured without thinking, then tacked on a sudden addendum. Or perhaps that beta testers shouldn't get full of themselves. If that hunch was correct, Kibao almost certainly suspected that I was a former beta tester myself. But on what evidence? Even Argo the Rat would never use the identity of beta testers as a business product. And I'd never spoken a word of my beta history to anyone. I watched Kibao's retreating back to the same sense of unease I'd felt yesterday. Huh? And without realizing it, I let out a grunt of understanding. Yesterday, he had tried to buy my annual blade plus six for the massive price of 40,000 coal. That was an undeniable fact. He clearly meant to use it in today's boss fight, putting aside whether he could handle the extra weight of the points I'd put into durability. His motive seemed obvious enough for me. He wanted to show off a powerful weapon at a crucial moment to add to his influence and leadership qualities. But if that were the case, he ought to have used 40,000 coal to a different set of weapons and armor when he did when, it, when the deal fell through. And today was the big day. But Kibao's scale mill and one handed sword on his back were the same as what they had what had they had been at the planning meeting. It wasn't a bad weapon. But he had the time and more than enough money to arrange something better. In fact, at my advice, Asuna had upgraded her weapon from the store-bought Iron Rapier to a rare drop weapon, a Wind Floret plus four. What was the point of keeping 40,000 coal in storage when you, you were about to undertake a battle that could easily be fatal? I had no more time to follow that line of thinking. Diavel the blue-haired knight was standing in his familiar spot on the lip of the fountain exercising his clear, loud voice. Okay, everyone. First, thanks. We've got all 44 members of all eight parties present. A cheer ripped through the square, followed by a spray of applause. I begrudgingly abandoned my musing and clapped along with the others. With a hearty smile for the crowd, the knight raised a fist and shouted, To be honest, I was prepared to call off the entire operation if anyone failed to show up. But... Seems that even entertaining that possibility was an insult to the rest of you. I can't tell you how happy I am. We've got the best damn raid party you could possibly want. Except for a few more bodies to round up to a nice even number. Some laughed, some whistled, some thrusted their fist like him. There was no doubting Diavel's leadership. But inwardly, I wondered if he was getting the crowd a little too revved up. Just as too much tension could lead to a poisonous fear, too much optimism caused sloppiness. It was enough to laugh off a few mistakes in the beta, but failure here would lead to death. Being on the uptide side was preferable in this case. I scanned the crowd around me and saw the Axe Warrior A. Gill and Team B, arms crossed, their faces hard. They could be counted in on a pinch. Kibao had his back turned to me, and so I couldn't read his expression. After everyone had gotten out their jeers, Diavel raised his hands in the air for a final cheer. Listen up, everyone. I just have one thing left to say. He reached down and drew his silver longsword, brandishing it high. Let's win this thing! I couldn't help but feel that the roar of excitement that ensued bore more than a little resemblance to the screams of ten thousand... I'd heard at the center of the town of beginnings four weeks earlier. 
Chapter 10. The procession from Tolbana to the Labyrinth Tower prickled at Austin's memory. After a few minutes of mulling it over, she finally realized what she was remembering. The school field trip from this January. They traveled to Queensland in Australia. Her classmates were thrown into a tizzy by the shift from midwinter Tokyo to blazing midsummer on the Gold Coast. They were rapturously excited, no matter where they went. There was nothing, not a single thing, that linked the two experiences, but she felt the atmosphere emanating from the 40-odd players marching through the three-lined path was very similar to her schoolmates, endless chattering, frequent bursts of laughter. The only thing that seemed different was the presence of monsters that could burst out of the trees at any moment. But with these confident warriors, they had been able to dice up any foes in seconds. Asuna and the swordsmen at her side were at the rear of the procession. She turned to him and started up with the conversation, choosing to overlook the atrocity that had occurred the night before. Hey, before you came here, did you play other MMO games? Is, is that what you call them? Uh, yeah, I suppose. He bobbed his head, still a bit intimidated. Does traveling around in other games feel like this? You know, like a hike? <laughs> I wish, he laughed and then shrugged. Unfortunately, it's not like this at all in other titles. See, if you're not in a full dive, you have to use a keyboard and a mouse or a controller to move around. You barely have any time to type anything in the chat window. Oh, I see. Of course, there are also games with voice and chat support, but I, I never played any of those. Uh, Austin tried to imagine a mob of game characters running silently in a flat screen monitor. I wonder what the real thing would feel like. Yeah? Real thing? He turned a skeptical glance on her. She tried to describe the image in her head. I mean, if there really was a fantasy world like this one, and a bunch of fighters and magicians teamed up on an adventure to defeat a terrible monster, what would they talk about on the road as they traveled? Or would they just march in silence? That's what I mean. The swordsman fell silent for a few awkward moments, and when Asuna finally looked at him, she became aware that the question she'd posed was actually quite childish. She turned away and tried to mumble a brief, never mind, but he spoke first. The road to death or glory, huh? He murmured. If the people made a living of doing that, I bet it would be no different from going out to a restaurant for dinner. If you have something to say, you say it. If not, you don't. At some point, I bet those boss raids would just be ordinary, assuming we could do enough of them to make it that way. <laughs> she couldn't help but giggle at the silliness of that statement, and then apologize quickly to cover it up. Sorry. I didn't mean to laugh, but that's really weird. This place is the polar opposite of ordinary. How can you make anything here become normal? <laughs> Good point. He chuckled quietly, but today makes it four weeks in here. Even if we do beat this boss, there are 99 more floors ahead. I was expecting this to take two, maybe three years. If it lasts that long, even the extraordinary would become ordinary. Once the enormity of those words... Once the enormity of those words would have thrown Asuna into shock and despair. But now the only thing that blew through her heart was the dry wind of resignation. You're very strong. I don't think I can do that. Survive in here for years and years? That's much more frightening to me than dying in today's battle. The swordsman gave her a brief glance, thrust his hands into the pockets of his grey coat, and murmured, You know, there'll be even nicer baths on the higher floors, if we can get there. Really? She asked without thinking, then gasped. She'd fought down her rising embarrassment and gave him a quiet warning. So, you remembered. In that case, I'll be feeding you an entire barrel of sour milk. Which means you'll have to survive this battle first. He shot back, grinning. 
Chapter 11. At 11 o'clock a.m., we reached the labyrinth. At 12.30, we were on the top floor. It was I was secretly relieved that we at least hadn't lost anyone so far. After all, the majority of our group's members were no doubt experiencing their very first raid at near full capacity. And in, and in this world, every first experience was fraught with the possibility of accidents. I did get the chills on three separate occasions. Teams F and G, who were equipped with long weapons like spears and halberds, were ambushed during, along their flanks by kobolds in narrow corridors. During close battles in SAO, accidentally grazing another player with a swing could not cause no damage, and hence no crime, but it acted as a blocking obstacle that cancelled out any low-level sword skills. It happened more often to spears, given their long reach, making surprise attacks by close-range enemies quite dangerous. Dialvel made excellent use of his leadership qualities in the face of this predicament. He boldly commanded the other members aside from a single team leader to stand down, used a heavy sword skill to knock the monsters off balance, and then switched out for close-range fighters. It was the kind of strategy that only, sim only someone f familiar with leading a party could employ so quickly and assuredly. In that sense, perhaps it was presumptuous for a solo player to be concerned about too much excitement before we'd left. Dialvel had his own philosophy on how to lead, and as a member of this raid who'd come this far, it was now my duty to put my full trust in him. Finally, the massive doors were visible ahead. I stood up on tiptoes to see over the rest of the group. The gray stone surface was adorned with relieves and terrible humanoids the heads of beasts. In most MMOs, the kobold was nothing more than a typical starting monster, but in SIO, they were fearsome demi-humans. They brandished swords and axes, which meant they could use sword skills of their own, because skills were far faster, stronger, and more accurate than simple swinging attacks. Even low-level skills could deal astonishing damage if it landed a critical hit on a defenseless target. The fact that Asuna had made it to the top level of the labyrinth using nothing, nothing more than the simple linear attack proved just how powerful sword skills could be in the right hands. Listen up for a sec, I remember to Asuna, leaning close. The ruined kobold sentinels we're supposed to, f to fight are only like bodyguards for the actual boss, but they're still pretty tough. Like I explained yesterday, their heads and chests are armored, so just hurling linear at them over and over isn't going to work. The Vincer glare shot... The fencer's glare shot back at me from under the hood. I know that. I have to hit them straight in the throat. That's right. I'll use my sword skills to knock back their pole axes, and you just switch in and finish them off. She nodded and turned to the giant's doors. I stared at her profile for a few more seconds. The only difference is when and where you die. Sooner or later. She claimed on our first encounter. I couldn't let her prove that statement. Austin's linear suggested an incredible talent, and she had no idea. Not all shooting stars burned up in the atmosphere. Some of them withstood the fires and made their way to Earth. If she survived today's battle, I was certain that she would be known all throughout Aincrad as the fastest and most beautiful swordsman in the game. Countless players crushed by fear and desperation could look to her guiding light. I was certain of it. That role was something I could never fulfill myself with my with my beta testing path. I swallowed my determination and faced forward. Dialvel had just arranged the seven other parties into perfect formation. Even our charismatic leader couldn't simply lead a light-hearted cheer now. Humanoid monsters would detect the shouts and come running. Instead, Dialvel raised his longsword and gave a hearty nod. Forty-three others brandished their weapons and signaled back, his blue hair waving, the knight put his other hand on the center of the door. Let's go, he shouted, and pushed hard. Was it always this vast? My first thoughts upon setting foot in the first floor boss chamber after four months was skepticism. It was a rectangular room that stretched away from us. It had to be roughly 60 feet from the other side and closer to 300 from the far wall to the door. Given that the rest of the floor had been mapped out, the empty space remaining on the map was a good indication of the size of the room. 
but it seemed much larger in person than it did on the page. The distance was actually rather troublesome. Giant doors on Icrad's boss chambers did not close during battle. If all seemed lost, there was always the option of running back to the door to avoid total defeat. However, turning your back to the opponent left a player defenseless against long-distance sword skills that could cause movement delay, if not a total stun effect. Therefore, it was better to retreat backward while still facing the boss. In a vast room like this, that distance might seem endless. Retreat would be easier if the higher floor boss battles after players had earned their teleport crystals that allowed instantaneous escape. On the other hand, they were extremely expensive, so using them would be very costly. As I pondered, the various scenarios for withdrawal, a crude torch on the light wall in the dark chamber audibly burst into life. One after another, torches lit themselves down the walls. With each successive source of light, the gamma level in the room increased. Cracked paving stones and walls, countless skulls of various sizes, and ugly but massive throne on the far end of the chamber, and a silhouette seated upon it. Diavel brought down his sword in its direction. At that signal, 44 warriors raised a valiant roar and raced through the chamber. First, down the chamber was a hammer-wielding fighter with a large heater shield like a, meat, like a metal plate. The leader of Team A. Just behind them and to the left were Agil the Axe Warrior and his Team B. On the right were Team C, made of Diavel and his five party members, and then Team D led by a man with a very tall greatsword. Behind that line were Kibao's Team E and the two pole arm teams F and G. At long last, two forgotten stragglers. Just as the leader of the head team A reached 60 feet from the throne, the previously immobile figure leapt up ferociously. It did a flip in midair and landed with an earth-shaking crash and then opened a wolf-like jaw and roared. The appearance of Ilfang the Kobold Lord, King of the Beastmen, was exactly as I remembered it. His burly body was covered in grayish hair and easily over six feet tall. His reddish gold eyes glinted menacingly, thirsty for blood. In his right hand was an axe fashioned from bone, and in his left a buckler of skins and leather. Hanging off the back of his waist was a massive talwar that had been nearly five feet long. The kobold lord raised his bone axe and swung it down upon the leader of Team A with all of his strength. The thick heater shield took the brunt head on, and a bright flash and fierce shudder filled the room. As though that sound was a signal, three heavily armed monsters leapt down from the holes, sounded holes, po yeah leapt down from holes high on the side walls. These were the ruined kobold sentinels that accompanied their leader. Kibao's team E and their backup team G successfully descended on the three and draw to draw their attention. Asa and I shared a look and dashed over to the nearest kobold. And so it was that at 1240 on December 4th, the first boss monster in Heinkrad was finally challenged. Ilfang's HP gauge had four bars. He fought with his axe and shield through the third bar, but at the final stage he would throw them aside and produce his giant Talwar. The change in his attacking patterns was the biggest challenge in the fight, but this transition was detailed fully in Argo's guide. Yesterday's meeting, we spent plenty of time studying the change in his sword skills once switching to the Talwar and how to counteract them. As I dealt with the sentinels that slipped away from teams E and G, I kept an eye on the state of the front line. It seemed like the strategy would hold strong. The switches and pot rotation of the tanks and attackers were working smoothly, and the average HP readouts of all of the individual parties listed on the left side of my vision showed a solid 80% across the board. Please, please let this hold up. I prayed with all of my being, something I never did as a solo player. Chapter 12 At the point that he transported her out of the Labyrinth Tower through unknown means, Asuna had a feeling that the black-haired swordsman was talented, but upon properly witnessing him in battle for the first time, she realized just how inadequate that description was. He was strong. In fact, there was something within his fighting that couldn't simply be summed up by strength. 
Something that transcended power and speed. Something that suggested the next dimension. Asuna had no experience with online games or full dive systems, so she didn't know how to put this idea into words. If she had to describe it, he was optimized. There was no wasted movement in anything he did. His skills were precise and his strikes were heavy. With a quick swipe, he knocked the kobold's warrior, frightened Halberd, high up into the air and shouted, Switch! as he floated backwards. When Asuna leapt in to take his place, the kobold was still in the process of recovering its balance, leaving her enough time to unleash a linear thrust into its weak throat. It was all very simple. She thought back to what she'd said on her very first meeting. Your attacks are overkill. They're inefficient. To which she'd asked what was wrong with being thorough. At this point, she understood that there was plenty wrong with that. Eliminating waste created better poise, and poise widened her viewpoint. These kobold sentinels were supposedly much tougher than the kobold troopers she'd been fighting back then but she could clearly see that the creature's every swipe and kick. After her linear struck its critical weak point, the kobold only had a sliver of life left. The old Asuna would have evaded the enemy's attack by a hair and then unleashed another linear, but that would have been overkill. As soon as the pause after her sword skill had worn off, she jabbed the same point with minimal effort. That was enough to reduce the enemy's HP to zero. It burst into blue shards and disappeared. GJ, came, came the swordsman's voice from behind her. She didn't know what that was short for, so she offered him a neutral, you too. At this point, the boss kobold's first HP bar had just emptied. Diavel cried, on to the second, and more kobold sentinels poured out on the holes in the walls. Briefly forgetting that they were supposed to be sheer backup, Asuna joined her partner in dashing after the nearest kobold. The sword in her hand was brand new to her, but it, it already felt familiar and precise in the palm of her hand. It was as though everything in the sword, from its leather handle to its sharp, glimmering point, was an extension of her own arm. If this is what constitutes a true battle in this world, what I was doing before today was something similar, but very different. There must be something more. The swordsman is far, far ahead of me down that path. This is a virtual, illusionary world, and everything I do here is false, but this feeling, at least, is truth. That I want to see what he sees. The swordsman knocked the sentinel's axe high overhead. The next moment, Asuna shouted the command to switch on her own, and leapt in with her new favorite blade. The battle of the kobold lords and his cohorts against 44 players was going far smoother than I ever expected. Diavel's Team C took down the first HP bar, Team D was responsible for the second, and now Teams F and G were the main attack force halfway through the third bar. The worst that had happened so far was the tanks in Teams A and B going down to the yellow zone in their HP. No one had fallen into the red danger zone yet. Team E and the two extras had made such easy work of the kobolds' helpers that Team G, the other group's backup, was able to switch over to the main boss. What stood out to me most was the effort of Asuna and the fencer. Her linear skill had already impressed me on the first meeting, and with a better weapon, it was even sharper, piercing the throat of the kobold sentinels with ease and precision. The amount of time it took from initial motion to damage infliction had to be half of the ordinary time when allowing the automatic system of systems to take over. I had been studying and practicing ways to intentionally boost my sword skills since the beta, and even I wasn't sure if I could match that speed. And this was from a total newbie who only knew one skill. A shiver ran down my back at the thought of her limitless potential if she had more knowledge and refined her instincts. If possible, I wanted to see that transformation happen with my own eyes, but I quickly stashed the idea away. When I had taken the path of a self-interested solo player one month ago, I'd lost any right to connect with others. My very first friend in this world, Klein, was probably still busy leveling up around Town of Beginnings, trying to keep all of his party members alive. 
Unrelated to my own bitter reminiscence, Asuna was just finishing off her second victim. Ruin Kobold Sentinels were very rare monsters that did not spawn anywhere else, so even if they weren't as lucrative as the boss itself, they still dropped plenty of experience, coal, and items. The money was set to automatically divide between all the raid members, but the experience belonged only to Asuna and me for our direct effort in defeating the creature, and the looted items were her bonus for inflicting the killing blow. For that reason, if Kibao was being perfectly honest, he wanted Team E to do all the killing itself. But the two of us, the supposed leftovers, were dispatching our targets much faster than their full party of six. Surely, he couldn't complain about that. But just as the thought passed through my mind, Kibao's gravely rasp issued from behind me. Your plan backfired, eh? Serves you right? What? I turned around, confused. Only two of the three sentinels that spawned in the third stage of the battle were left, and they were nearly dead. We had enough time for a brief conversation before more of them showed up. The cactus-headed swordsman squinted hard at me and raised his voice. Drop the lame act. I already know exactly what y'all slipped your ways into the boss fight. Why? You mean to defeat the boss? What other reason could there be? Oh, so you're going to deny it? You know what you're after. We clearly weren't seeing eye to eye about the substance of the conversation. I clenched my teeth in frustration and anger. Kibao finally came out and said what was on his mind. You think I don't know? I've heard about all about your style. How you always use dirty tricks to steal the L.A. on all the bosses. What? L.A. Last attack. In a way, he was right. I'd made a solid practice of trying to leave the smallest amount of health possible and then unleash my most powerful sword skill in order to gain the largest LA bonus possible. But that was nothing to do with our current circumstances. It was just during, only during the Sword Art Online closed beta that had ended long ago. Kibao knew that I was not only a beta tester, but the way I'd played. But hang on. He just said he had heard about my style, which meant it must have come from someone else. But who would have... A second burst of understanding shot through my brain. Kibao had been attempting to buy my annual blade plus six for a preposterous price through Argo the Rat. Yesterday, he'd finally upped his offer past the market rate to 40,000 coal. However, when I refused his offer, he did not spend that money elsewhere. No, he couldn't spend that money because it wasn't his. Kibao was just another proxy, like Argo after him. That's how he was able to talk to me during the next day, as though nothing had happened. The true buyer was someone else, and that was the source of the 40,000 coal. By placing another person between them and Argo, no amount of money I paid back up the line could buy the true purchaser's name. This conspirator gave Kibao beta information, manipulating him into inciting his hatred for former testers which meant that this mystery buyer's intention was not to gain the annual blade plus six for improved attack points. Perhaps that was a side benefit, but the real point was something else. They wanted to drive down my attack power to prevent me from making use of my sword, my skill at learning last attack bonuses. Kibao, whoever told you that story, how did they gain that information about the beta test? Ain't it obvious? They put up a grip of cash to buy the info from the rat. All so they could sniff out the hyenas among the raid party. Well, that was a lie. Argo might sell her own status numbers for the right price, but she would never sell beta tester information. I ground my teeth into fury, but was momentarily distracted by a shout of triumph from up ahead. The boss's lengthy fourth stage HP bar was finally at its last step. I couldn't help but watch. After they'd eliminated the third bar, pole arms F and G retreated leaving the fully recovered Team C to charge in and clash with the boss. Dialvel, the blue-haired knight, party leader, and commander of the raid sparked dazzlingly into the darkness of the grimy dungeon. Oh! Ilfane the kobold lord roared, his loudest and fiercest yet. The final trio of ruined kobold sentinels appeared from the holes in the walls. Go ahead, take one of them little kobolds. Get your last attack in, Kibao snarled his voice dripping with scorn, and ran back to Team E partners. I hadn't recovered from the shock and confusion of our conversation, 
but I had no choice but to turn back and find Asuna. What were you talking about? She asked quietly, but I had no time to do anything but shake my head. Nothing. Let's just take down these enemies. Okay. We turned your blades on the closest approaching sentinel. The next instant, I sensed something and looked back to the main battle as briefly as I could. The kobold lord had just thrown aside his bone axe and leather buckler. He roared once again and reached back behind his waist, gripped a handle wrapped in crude rags, and pulled out the long, malevolent talwar. I'd seen this transition in attack patterns many times during the beta, but this point until from this point until he died, Ilfang would only use curved sword skills. He made a terrifying sight in his berserk rage, but was actually easier to deal with than before, if you just knew how. His attacks were all vertical, long-range slices, so as long as you identified where he was aiming when he attacked, it was a snap to evade, even at close range. On Diavel's orders, the six men of Team C spun into a circle surrounding the boss. This formation would not have worked against his wide horizontal swipes with the bone axe. The order was so precise and confident, you'd never guess he had nothing more to do, nothing more to go on than a flimsy little strategy guide. Now the six could continue attacking and evading the Talwar's signs until the battle was... <clears throat> a small grunt escaped my throat. In giving Kibao 40,000 coal and attempting to buy my weapon from me, Player X was attempting to prevent me from scoring the last hit point for personal gain, or so I presumed. While I still had my sword, X's goal was essentially fulfilled at this point. I was a straggler at the very fringe of the raid, taking on those wimpy sentinels. I wouldn't get within 40 feet of the boss. But in that case, would the identity of Player X be whoever was poised to land that last attack now? It made no sense to pony up to so much money just to keep me from being successful. The only way that kind of expenditure made any sense was that the spender wanted to finish off the boss himself. Meaning, the mystery player who was manipulating Kibao and knew of my beta tester past was none other than... Here it comes, Asuna cried, snapping me out of my train of thought. The kobold sentinels lunged forward with its halberd, and only an instant reaction with the slant sword skill was able to parry the blow. Switch! I leapt backward, and Asuna took the front line. Again, I glanced back at the main battle, a good 20 yards to our left. The boss's invincible transition animated finished, and then the combat was set to resume. First to catch his attention was the blue-haired knight, who prepared to deflect the boss's initial attack. Was it you? Dialvel the knight, did you arrange all of this? There was no answer to my silent question, of course. Ilfang bellowed and lifted his curved blade high overhead. Again, something flickered in through my mind. It was alien. Something was wrong. There was a difference between Kobold Lord I knew and this boss monster. It wasn't his color, nor his size, nor his face or voice. The difference was not in the creature, but the weapon he held. From my position, I could only see a vague silhouette of the blade. But was it always that slender? The gentle curve was the same shape I remembered, but the width and its luster were both different. That texture wasn't crude cast iron, it was tempered, sharpened to look like steel. I'd once seen a weapon like that. On the tenth floor of Aincrad, a weapon carried by the most fearsome of foes I encountered in the beta, clad in their red armor. That was a monster-exclusive weapon, something not available to any player. Ah, uh, ah! Uh. I gasped, forcing more air into my tense lungs so I could scream with all of my voice, No! Get back! Everyone jump back as far as you can! But my warning was drowned out by the sound effect of Ilfang's sword skill. The kobold's massive bulk pounced low on the ground and leapt upward. His twisted, he twisted his body in midair, building momentum for his strike. As he fell, all the accumulated power burst outward into a crimson whirlwind. Plain horizontal, angle 360 degrees. A wide area katana skill called Zamuji Guruma, spiral wheel. 
The six lights that spun out from Ilfang were red as sprays of blood. The readout from Team C's average HP on the left side of my vision instantly plunged below halfway into the yellow zone. I could see my individual totals if I touched the bar with my finger, but there was no point in doing that. They clearly all suffered the same amount of damage. It was bad enough that a wide area attack more than half of the player's full health, but this attack effects did not stop there. The six members lying on the floor had blurry yellow circles around their heads. They were afflicted with temporary paralysis, a stun effect. Among the dozens or so negative status effects in SAO, nothing was worse than paralysis or blindness. At most, the effects lasted only 10 seconds, but because of that short span, there was no recovery methods. If a frontline member got stunned, his partners had to jump in without waiting for the switch call and try to draw the enemy's attention. However, they were all stunned. The fight strategy had been meticulously planned out beforehand. All seemed to be proceeding well, and Yavel, the trustworthy and capable leader, was knocked flat on the ground. All of these reasons combined kept the other teams in the raid rooted to their spot. Amidst the eerie silence, the kobold lord recovered from his massive attack and prepared to resume fighting. Finally, I came to my sentence. Watch out for the follow-up! I tried to scream as Agil and his party moved in to help, but they were not quick enough. <sighs> the beast howled and swung its double-handed blade straight upward from its resting position near the floor. The sword skill, Yukifune, or Rising Ship. It was aimed right for the... Right for Diavel, who was still lying prone on the floor. His silver mailed body rose off the ground as though pulled upward by the pale red arc of light. This move's damage was not so bad, but it was also not the end of the kobold's assault. Its large wolf like mouth opened in a fierce grin. The sword blade glowed red again. Yukifune was merely the initial move of a skill combo. The best response, when lifted into the air like that, was to curl into a ball and focus on maximizing defense. But it was impossible to know that upcoming, that upon facing it for the very first time. Diavel pulled back his long sword in midair, hoping to f fire back a sword skill, but the system did not recognize his flailing motion as the initiation of a skill. Ilfeng's giant sword caught the knight dead on. Two stripes up and down, faster than the eye could follow. Then a brief pause and a thrust. If I recall correctly, this three-hit combo was called Hiyogi, Scarlet Fan. The blows landing on the knight's body burst with brilliant color and clashing sounds, the indicators of critical hits. His avatar flew 60 feet through the air, well over the raid party's heads, until he came crashing down next to me. His HP bar gauge was down in the red and decreasing rapidly. An odd squeak gurgled from my throat. I hit the oncoming sentinel's halberd with my powerful slant. It caught the haft of the weapon, breaking it in two and stunning the kobold. Asuna quickly darted in, delivering the final blow to its throat. I spun around, ignoring the monster's explosive death animation, to look at Diavel. Once I'd finally locked eyes with him at a distance of mere feet, sparks went off in my brain. I know this player. The name and appearance were different, but I was certain that the old Einkrad, I had seen this player. Perhaps even spoken with him. Dialvel was a former beta tester, just like me. And like me, he'd kept his past hidden. In fact, he'd found himself partners. So that pressure to keep that secret hidden had to be much worse than mine. But that former tester knowledge was poisoning him, with the crucial juncture of the end of the first floor in sight. I didn't recognize him, but he knew me and he knew that I scored last attack bonuses by the dozens in the beta test of Einkrad. He suspected I would do the same thing again this time. It was highly likely the floor boss would drop unique items, which would vastly increase anyone's stats. Now the SAO was deadly, increased power meant increased survivability. Diavo wanted to do anything in his power to get Ulfeng's rare loot in order to survive the trials of Sword Art Online. Not as a selfish solo player, but the leader of a group. Diavel seemed to understand my conclusion. His eyes, blue as his hair, squinted angrily for a moment, and then he took to a serene light. His lips trembled 
and parted to speak words that only I could hear. You have to take it from here, Kirito. Kill the... He couldn't finish his sentence. Diavo the Knight, leader of the first raid party of Aincred, turned to blue glass and shattered. Chapter 14 A roar, or perhaps a scream, filled the Bosphorus chamber. Nearly every member of the raid party was clutching his weapon as though desperate for something to cling to, eyes wide, but no one moved. The idea that their leader would be the first to fall, to die, was so far out of expectation that no one knew how to react. I was no different. Two options alternated within my head, to run or to fight. We'd suffer two major blows. The boss's weapon and skills were not what I had expected, or our leader, and our leader was down. The group ought to retreat from the boss chamber immediately, but if we turned our backs to Ilfeng to run, his long-range katana skills would stun at least the ten closest to him, if not more, and lead to many more deaths at the hands of the combo that killed Diavel. On the other hand, it would be difficult to retreat while trying to face the beast and defend against unknown skills. Because of the extra time that travel would take compared to turning and sprinting, the gradual loss of HP might eventually claim just as many victims. Most importantly of all, if we suffered that many fatalities, including our leader, and the battle ended in defeat, we might never be able to arrange a raid party of the scale again. It could spell disaster for our possibility in defeating SAO. The 8,000 survivors would be permanently prisoners rather than warriors trapped on the first floor until some ultimate unknown conclusion. Two simultaneous sounds jarred me out of hesitation. It was the sound of Ilfang fresh out of his combo cooldown, beginning another attack, clanging and screaming, the sound of damage ringing through the darkness. The other was the voice of Kibao, slumped to his knees next to me. Why? Why? You were a leader, Diavel. How can you be the first to go? It would be all too easy to say because he was greedy and tried to get the last attack, but I couldn't do it. I thought back to that scene where Kibao railed against Diavel during the first planning meeting. Kibao demanded that the former beta testers apologize and offer up their ill-gotten loot or face ostracization. Diavel did not override his opinion. He allowed it to be discussed openly. Perhaps that little act was Diavel's offer to Kibao, his price in exchange for taking on the task of negotiating the sale of my sword. Diavel granted Kibao a public stage to air his grievances with the former beta testers. It didn't pick up steam, thanks to Egil's level-headed response, but if all had gone to plan with this boss battle, Kibal no doubt planned to bring up the topic again. Clearly, he didn't have a single ounce of suspicion in his mind that Diavel might actually be one of those beta testers himself. He trusted in Diavel, thinking him to be the model of an upstanding retail player someone who could stand in contrast to the underhanded testers. Could there be a more devastating scene for him to witness? I had to be the one to put a hand on his shoulder to force him to his feet. No time for disappointment, I growled. His eyes glittered with the familiar hatred. But what? You're the leader of Team E. If you, lose your con if you lose your cool, your party will die. There might still be more Sentinels on their way. In fact, I'm sure of it. You have to take care of them. What about you, then? just gonna up and run for it? Of course not. That should be obvious. I leveled the annual blade in my right hand menacingly. I'm gonna score the last attack bonus. Every choice I'd made in the last month since being taken prisoner by this realm was for the sake of my own survival, nothing more. I didn't share the vast store of knowledge I gained in the beta test. I reaped the rewards for all the best hunting grounds and quests. I focused only on strengthening myself. If I was going to uphold that principle, this was my chance to make a break for the exit. While many other people stood between me and the boss, I ought to secure my own safety, letting the mad kobold lord sacrifice my fellows using them as shields. But there was not a shred of that idea running through my mind now. Something like fire shot through my veins, pushing my feet onward toward the precipice between life and death. 
Perhaps my source of inspiration was Diabell's final message. Kill the boss. He was trying to say. Not help everyone escape. He died because he tried to tweak the odds to give him the best chance of getting that coveted last attack on the boss, but there was no doubting the ex excellence of his leadership. His final order was not retreat, but battle. As a member of the raid, I had to follow his plan, his last will. There was only one concern I couldn't erase. Before the battle, I swore to myself that no matter what happened, I would protect Austin's life. She'd shown a glimmer of talent beyond even my own. As a fan of the VR MMO genre, I couldn't stand to see potential like that plucked before it had a chance to bloom. I, I turned to Asuna, prepared to warn her to stay back and make a break for it, and the front line broke down. But as though she knew what I was going to say, she cut me off first. I'm going to. I'm your partner. I didn't have time to shut her down or explain why she shouldn't. I had to simply ignore my indecision and accept. All right. Let's do this. We started running towards the far side of the chamber. Roars and screams washed over us. None aside from Diavel had died yet, but the fighters at the front were all below half of their HP, and the leaderless Team C was down 20%. Some players had fully panicked and abandoned their positions. It would be less than a minute before the group completely lost control at this rate. The first step was calming down the party, but a half-hearted command would be swallowed by the chaos. I needed something short and powerful, but I had no experience leading a group, and I had no idea what to say. To my surprise, Asuna irritatedly grabbed her hooded cape and ripped it off. She shone as though all the torches hanging on the walls had been condensed into the source of light. Her long brown hair seemed to blast away the gloom of the chamber with a deep golden light. The image of Asuna racing, her hair rippling in the wind, was like a shooting star in the midst of a dungeon. Even with the panicking players were stunned into silence at her otherworldly beauty. I seized upon this miraculous instant of silence and screamed out an order with all of my strength. Everyone, ten steps towards the exit. The boss won't use an area of attack if he's not surrounded. When the last echo of my voice died out, time seemed to flow once more. The players at the front parted to the sides to let me and Asuna through, as though following this train of thought himself, Ilfang turned to face us. Some same order as we used against the Sentinels, Asuna. Here we go. The fence the fencer shot me a glance while I called but when I called her by her name, but she looked back ahead just as quickly. Alright. The Kobold Lord took his left hand off the long katana and put it to his waist. That looked like the animation for I held my breath, initiated my own sword skill. My right hand and the sword went across my body to the left side of my waist and I bent over forward until I might flip over. If the angle wasn't sharp enough, the game system would not recognize it as the start of a skill. I pounced with my right leg from a starting stance so low I was nearly crawling. My body shining blue, it took only an instant to cross the 30 feet to the boss. This was Rage Spike, a one-handed sword skill charging. The boss's katana took on a slick green shine, and a bit faster than my eye could follow in a direct long-range katana skill, Suji Kaze, or Cyclone. It was just an instantaneous attack that struck as soon as it began, so there was no way to react once it started. Ah! I howled, bringing my sword up from the front, up from the left into the path of Ilfang's blade. Sparks exploded with a high-pitched clanging, and we both knocked back several feet by the force of the collision. Asuna, who'd been following close behind my burst of speed, did not miss this opportunity. See ya! Her linear hand deep within the kobold lord's right side. His fourth HP bar sank, not by much, but it was enough. Even as I felt the shudder of the impact in my right hand, I tried to calculate the risk of our situation. When I had faced Ilfang's Talwar skills in the beta, I wasn't strong enough to cancel his attacks with my own. But because of this katana was lighter than the Talwar, I hadn't lost any HP in our clash. The trade-off was that his moves were now much faster. Was it even possible to deflect and parry his ensuing rush without slipping at least at any point? There was one other thing. Asuna's Linear could dispatch a kobold trooper with three hits 
and a Sentinel with four. But this boss's monster HP were far, far beyond his simple enemies. I couldn't guess how many hits it would take her to finish off this final HP gauge. One of the advantages of player fighting a boss was that the enemy's massive size made it easy for many people to attack it at once. So ideally, we'd have one more damage dealer on either side, but all the teams A through G were heavily damaged at that moment. We couldn't call for assistance until they had healed themselves with potions. Asuna and I had had to hold out on our own, and I wasn't originally expecting to attempt it all by myself. Well, now I had double the help, so what more could I ask for? Here he comes again, I cried once I was out of my post-skill delay, concentrating with all my willpower on the boss's massive blade. In the Thousand Man Sword Art Online closed beta test, the previous August, I made it as far as the 10th floor of Aincrad would, but never saw the bosses on that floor. The labyrinth of that floor was nicknamed the Castle of a Thousand Serpents, and I simply couldn't get past the spot guarded by a particularly tough kind of samurai monster called Orochi Elite Guards. They used bewilderingly freeform katana skills that no player could wield. Each attack I suffered added the skill names and descriptions to my reference menu, but I consulted dis dis desperately in order to memorize the information. By the time I could finally recognize the initiation of each skill, it was August 31st, the end of the test. The Orochis and Ilfang were completely different in shape and size, but they were both humanoid, and their attacks were, as far as I could tell, the same. I was able to follow my memory from four months ago to cancel out all of the attacks, even the instant ones. Needless to say, it was a high wire act. The boss's slash attacks had a high enough basic damage that just tossing up slant or horizontal with the system assist would get me knocked backward. I needed to use them while pushing my body along the thrust of the skills to boost their power to the point that I could actually stop the blows. This kind of system independent technique could be very powerful if successful, but it was not without its risks. One wrong move right might interfere with the system's automatic assistance, perhaps even cancel out the sword skill entirely. In the months since I played SAO, both beta and release, I'd never used so much concentration for so long until now. And after that 15th, 16th, 15th and 16th parry, I finally slipped. Damn, I hissed, and tried to cancel out of my half-initiated vertical skill. I'd read Ilfang's swing as an overhead slice, but he spun it around a half-circle to come up from below instead. This was Kingetsu, or Phantom Moon. An attack that either landed high or low at a random chance, despite starting with the same animation. I brought back my annual blade in a hurry, but it was too late. An unpleasant shock struck my body and knocked me still. Ah! Asuna shouted next to me, by the striking katana had already caught me directly on the front. There was a sharp shock, cool as ice. My entire body went numb, and my HP bar lost nearly a third of its points. While I fell to my knees with a single impact of the blow, Asuna plunged towards the kobold king. I tried to tell her not to. Ginketsu had a very quick recovery period. The blade ended up high in the air after his attack on me, and now began to glimmer again. It was Hyogi. The three-part combo that killed Diavel. <sighs> a bellowed rumble f rumbled forth just below the katana. Just before the katana hit Asuna, a massive glowing green weapon swung just barely over her head, utilizing the two-handed axe skill, Whirlwind. The katana and the whirling axe clash. Their impact rocked the entire chamber and Ilfang was blasted backwards. On the other hand, the attacker had held firm with nothing more than leather sandals and slid back only a few feet. It was the brawny brown-skinned leader from Team B, Agil. He shot a grin at me over his shoulder while I scrambled to my coat pockets. We'll back you up until you finish your pots. Can't keep forcing a damage dealer to do a tank's job. Thanks, man, I replied, pushing down the strange feeling that was rising in my chest with a healing potion. Agil wasn't the only one who came forward. Several other players, mostly from Team B, had finished recovering and were ready to resume combat. I sent Asuna a look that only I was o that I, I sent Asuna a look that said that I was okay, and shouted as loud as I could to the rest of the group. 
If you surround the boss all the way, he'll unleash his full circle attack. I'll warn you about the trajectory of his attack so whoever's in front can prepare to block it. You don't need to con cancel it with the sword skill. Just deflecting it with a shield or weapon should cut down most of the damage. Okay, the others roared in response. The kobold lord added his own bellow to the fray. It seemed as though there was a hint of irritation to it. I checked on the rest of the party as I slumped back to the wall and recovered with some low-level healing potions. As I feared, when I noticed the boss's weapon had been altered, they had added extra ruined kobold sentinels to the battle as well. Kibal's team E and the relatively unharmed polearm team G were dealing with four of the creatures now. They hadn't suffered too much so far, but I had a feeling the groups of four sentinels could continue to pop at regular intervals as long as Ilfang was alive. Without any help, the two parties would eventually have their hands full. Between the back line and the front, the most grievously wounded party members, such as the survivors of Team C, were working on healing. Frustratingly, potions in this game worked on a heal over time basis rather than instantly recovering. The gauge would fill up pixel by pixel. On top of that, once the potion was empty, a cooldown icon appeared on the bottom of the player's view, meaning that until the effect wore off, any extra potions would provide no benefit. To add insult to injury, the weak potions from the first floor NPCs taste disgusting. Because of that cooldown timer, it took a significant amount of time to recover from heavy damage. The common strategy was therefore to switch with another member once you'd suffered full potions worth of damage, also known as pot rotation. But that pattern broke down when there were too many injured to stand and fight. On higher floors, there would be valuable healing crystals that acted instantaneously as long as you didn't concern yourself with the astonishing price, but those weren't an option for us down here. So the battle would be determined by how long Eagle's group of six could hold out in the face of Ilfeng's fierce attacks. And in order to give them a fighting chance, I had to identify his skills as soon as the tell appeared. I took a knee and focused all of my senses on the boss's kobold, shouting out warnings like, Flat slice from the right, or downward to the left, as soon as I recognized them. Eagle's group followed my instructions, prioritizing guarding with their shields and large weapons, rather than gambling on a neutralizing counter-strike. As tank builds, they had excellent defense and HP, but not enough to hold the boss's sword skills to zero damage. Their HP bars shrank bit by bit with every crashing sound effect. And between them all, one fencer danced spryingly here and there. Asana. She was careful never to pass by Ilfeng's front or rear, and whoever was there, and whenever there was any delay in his movement, she delivered a powerful linear. Over time, this, that would raise his aggro level toward Asana. But the six tanks regularly performed aggro skills like how to draw the enemy's attention. For nearly five minutes, this dangerous, delicate game continued, threatening to fall apart as soon as a single step of the process failed. Finally, the boss's HP fell below 30%, and his last bar turned red. In a moment of relief, one of the tanks lost focus and stumbled. He lurched to the side and only caught himself when he was directly behind Ilfang. Move! I screamed, but as I... As I was a fraction of a second too late, the bosses sensed that he was surrounded and unleashed a terrible roar. The large body sank to the ground, then launched itself directly upward into the air. His body and katana spun around and around, becoming a single vortex. The deadly full circle, Sumuji Garuma. Ah, I howled, and forgetting that my HP hadn't entirely healed yet, I leapt from the wall. I slung my sword over the right shoulder and pushed hard with my left foot. My back was hit with a sense of acceleration that shouldn't be possible based on my agility as, as my body like a rocket diagonally through the air. The one-handed sword thrust sonic leap had a shorter range than rage spike, but it could be aimed upward into the air as well. The sword took on a brilliant neon glow. Ahead of me, Ilfeng's katana was fiery crimson. Get there in time! I swung, stretching my arm as far as I would go. The tip of my annual blade plus six followed my wide arc and just barely caught Ilfeng's waist before he could unleash his Samuji Garuma. There was a heavy, sharp sound and the powerful, unmistakable flash of a critical hit. Kobold's large body slumped in midair and he fell to the ground without producing his deadly whirlwind. 
he growled, and fairly wildly, in an attempt to get to his feet. I'd inflicted him with the tumble status that was unique to humanoid monsters. Somehow, I managed to land and balance and, without missing a beat, pushed every last ounce of air out of my lungs. Full attack! Everybody, surround him! Agil's gang of six unleashed all the frustration of their long defensive shift. They spread out around Ilfang and tore into him with vertical sword skills. Axes, maces, and hammers flashed in a spectrum of color that pounded the kobold's body. The explosion of light and sound began to bite serious chunks out of the enemy's HP gauge, which was fixed at the top of every player's vision. It was a bet. If we could lower the kobold's lore's remaining HP to nothing before he got back to his feet, we won. But if he recovered from his status and instantly performed another Sujumuji Garuma, he would slice everyone from certain this time. My sonic leap was on cooldown. I couldn't attack him in midair again. Eagle's group finished their skill animations and initiated the preliminary motions for the next round, when suddenly Ilfang stopped struggling and abruptly sat up. We didn't make it in time, I hissed, when I noticed that Asuna was standing right next to me. Asuna, get ready to do your final linear with me. Okay. I had to grin at how quickly her response echoed my command. Six weapons snarled at once, and the boss was swallowed by a whirl of flashing lights again. But he did not wait for their onslaught to die down. Ilfang roared and got to his feet. There was barely 3% of his HP bar left, but there was, but there it shone, red and prominent. Agil was under a delay and couldn't move. Ilfang was impervious to stunning or knockbacks now that he'd recovered from the tumble. He transitioned smoothly into his jumping animation. animation. Go! I screamed. Asuna and I leapt together. She slipped between the tanks and unleashed a furious linear directly to the boss's left flank. A second later, my blue-lit sword ripped from the kobold king's right shoulder to his belly. On a single pixel remained on his HP bar. The beast man seemed to grin. I returned a ferocious smirk of my own and flipped my wrist back. Ah! I raised my sword skill with a sh sow shattering roar. The blade pitted here, there, here and there after the fierce ordeal tore upward to Ilfang's left shoulder to complete a V-shape, a two-part sword combo, vertical arc. The kobold's great form suddenly shuddered weakly and faltered backward. His wolf-like face turned up to the ceiling and emitted a keening wail. Countless tiny cracks appeared all over his body. His grip loosened and the katana clattered to the floor. Ilfang the kobold lord, boss of the first floor of Aincrad, shattered into a million tiny pieces of glass. And I slumped to the floor beneath some unseen pressure. A silent message in the purple system font read, You got the last attack. The remaining sentinels were obliterated at the same time as their boss. The torches on the walls shifted from a dim orange to a bright yellow, removing the gloom that shrouded the chamber. A cool breeze stepped through the room, carrying the heat of the battle with it. No one wanted to break the silence that descended teams E and G stood in the back. The center groups A, C, D, and F were kneeling in recovery mode, and Agil's team B, the last line of the tank defense, sat on the floor, all staring around warily. It was as though they were all afraid the Beast Lord might come back to life at any moment. Even if I was dead still, my sword skill raised at the end of the final slash. Was it truly the end? Or would there be another surprise, another alteration from the beta? A small pale hand touched my arm, gently pushing the sword down. That was Asuna's defensor. Her chestnut brown hair rippled in the breeze as she stared at me. Only now, with her familiar hooded cape removed, did I realize just how beautiful she was. No player could truly be this gorgeous. Asuna accepted my dumbstruck gaze without a complaint, something that would probably never happen again for several moments, and then quickly said, Nice work. Finally, it hit me. It was over. We finally removed the barrier that might have trapped 8,000 players on the first floor forever. As though the game was waiting for me to make that realization, a new message suddenly popped into existence. 
experience gained, coal distributed, and loot. The faces of the other members finally returned to normal as they received the same message. A rousing cheer broke the silence. Some roared with their fists in the air, some hugged their partners, some put in abs on absurd dances. Amid the storm of celebration, one man stood and approached. It was Agil. That was brilliant command, even better swordsmanship. Congratulations, this victory belongs to you. I couldn't help but notice that he spoke the word congratulations in English with perfect annotation. The big man grinned widely and extended a thick fist. I thought about how to respond to this and sadly couldn't come up with anything better than and muttered, nah. I lifted my own fist to at least give him a bump when someone bellowed behind me. Why? The entire room fell silent again in the agonized, tearful shriek. When I tore my gaze from Austin and Eagle to look at the man with light armor and a scimitar, I didn't recognize him at first, but when the next words poured from his twisted lips, I finally understood. Why did you abandon Diavel to die? He was from Team C, one of the parish knight Diavel's friends. Behind him, the other four members were standing, their faces red and miserable. Some were even crying. Abandon? You know what you did. You... You knew the moves the boss was using. If you'd told us the information to start with, Diavel wouldn't have died. The other raid members stirred at these words, murmuring among themselves. Now that you mention it, how did he know? That stuff wasn't in the strategy guide. To my surprise, Kibao did not follow up with these suspicions. He was standing to the side, his lips firmly closed as though grappling with indecision. Instead, another member of Team E stepped forward and jabbed an accusing finger at me. I, I know the truth. He's a beta tester. That's how he knew the boss's patterns. He's known all the beta quests and hunting grounds. He's hiding them from us. There was no surprise in the faces of Team C. I doubted Diavel had told them himself. He would not bring up the topic of beta tests on his own, as he was hiding his involvement with it but they no doubt all had the same suspicion when I identified those katana skills. The scimitar man's eyes boiled over with hatred, and he prepared to level another accusation at my feet when a mace warrior in Agil's tank party raised his hand and spoke calmly. But the strategy guide we got yesterday said it was based on the boss's attack patterns in the beta. If he's really a beta tester, wouldn't all his knowledge be based on what we learned from that? But, well, a scimitar wielder pressed on in anger, speaking for the rest of his teammates. That strategy guide was all fake. Argo sold us a bunch of lies. She's a former beta tester, too. There's no way she'd give away that truth for free. Uh-oh. This was headed in a bad direction. I held my breath. If I could take whatever criticism was directed my way. But we had to avoid an outright witch hunt on Argo and the other beta testers. But how to prevent their hatred from running out of control? I looked down at the dark floor. The, sy the system messages hanging in view came to sharper relief. My experience, coal, and items. An idea abruptly popped into my head, followed by a terrible indecision. If I made this choice, there was no telling what would happen to me. I might even be assassinated when I least expected it. As once I feared. But at the very least, it might redirect the anger away from Argo. Agil and Asuna had finally heard enough. They spoke up simultaneously. Oh, come on. Listen. I cut them off with a gesture and stepped forward, assuming an arrogant look and staring coldly into the scimitar wielder's eyes. I slumped my shoulders and spoke in as emotionless a voice as I could manage. A former beta tester? Please. Don't treat me like those amateurs. Uh, what? Think back. The odds were stacked against anyone trying to get into the SAO closed beta. How many of the thousands who made it in do you think were the true MMO fans? They were all noobs who barely understood how to level. You guys are way smarter about this game than they ever were. 42 players silently took to my disdainful words. There was a chill in the air, an unseen blade that traced the skin, just as it did before we tackled the boss. 
but I'm not like them. I grinned snidely. I made it to a floor that no one else in the beta reached. I know the boss's katana attacks because I'd fought mobs on the way higher floors who used the same moves. I know plenty about this game. Way more than Argo. What do you mean? A rasped, rasped the man from Team E who had first labeled me the beta tester. You're, you're worse than a beta tester. You're a cheat. A cheater. Calls of cheater and beta cheater rang out from me. Eventually, they blended together into a single new word. Beater. A beater? I like the sound of that. I proclaimed loudly for the entire group to hear, fixing them all the way with the level stare. That's right. I'm a beater. Don't you ever insult my skill by calling me a former tester. It was for the best. Now the four to five hundred beta testers still out there in the game could be broadly divided into two categories. The vast majority were simple amateur testers, and the select few were filthy beaters who hoarded their information. The hostility of the retail players would be turned upon the beaters. Anyone being outed as a beta tester wouldn't necessarily have to be afraid of retribution. In exchange, I'd never be invited to join any front-running guilds or parties but that was no different from the way I already played. I'd been a solo player, and I would continue to be one. It was that simple. I looked away from the pale-faced scimitar wielder and the others from Team E and C, opened my player window, and fiddled with the equipment at Mannequin. Instead of the familiar old dark gray leather coat, I put on the new unique armor I'd just received from the boss, the Coat of Midnight. Tiny lights covered my chest, and faded old gray material turned into sleek black leather. It was a long coat, too, and the hem hung down below my knees. With a flourish of my new coat, I spun around and faced the small door at the back of the boss chamber. I'll go activate the teleport gate on the second floor. It's a bit of a hike through the wilderness to reach the main city once you leave the exit above, so you can tag along, if you're not afraid of being slaughtered by unfamiliar mobs. Agil and Asuna gave me appraising looks as I stood forward. Their eyes said they knew what I was doing. That, at least, was some small comfort. I gave them a hint of the smile, picked up my pace, and pushed open the door on the back wall behind my empty throne. At the top of a narrow spiraling staircase, there was another door. It opened. I opened it gently and was met by a stunning sight. The door opened directly from the middle of a sheer cliff, with a narrow terrace-styled downward staircase carved out of the rock to the left. For the moment, I simply drank in the sight of the second floor. Unlike the varied terrain of the first floor, the second was a series of rocky mesas from end to end. The upper areas of the mountains were covered from soft green grasses, grazing land and large cattle monsters. Urbis, the main town of the second floor, was carved directly into the top of one of these mesas. All I had to do was to send these stairs, walk half a mile to reach Urbis, and then touch the teleport gate in the center of the city to activate it. At that point, it would be connected to the teleporter in the town of Beginnings below, and anyone could travel between the two. If I actually did die in the short journey, or just sat here and did nothing, the teleporter would activate automatically anyway, two hours after the boss's destruction. But word had no doubt spread to the town of Beginnings about today's attempt on the boss, and I could imagine a crowd of players standing in the town center, waiting for the moment the blue warp gate would appear. I wanted to get to Urbis and open it up for them, but I had the right to stop and enjoy the scenery for a first minute. I walked forward and sat down at the edge of the terrace carved out of the rock face. Beyond the main craggy mountains was a tiny silver sliver of blue sky in the outer perimeter of Eincrad. How many minutes did I sit there? Eventually I heard a petite footsteps coming up the spiral staircase behind me. I didn't turn around. The owner of the steps reached the door and stopped, and sighed, and came to sit next to me. I told you not to come, I muttered. She looked affronted. No, you didn't. You said to tag along if I wasn't afraid of dying. Oh, right. Sorry. I ducked my head 
in embarrassment and glanced over at Asuna, whose face was beautiful from any angle. Her light brown eyes looked back at me briefly, and then returned to the scenery below. She exhaled and said, It's so pretty. After a minute of silence, she spoke again. I have messages from Agil and Kibao. Oh? What did they say? Agil said we should tackle the second floor boss too, and Kibao said she cleared her throat, expression serious, and clumsily attempted to recreate Kibao's Kansai accent. You saved my ass this time, but I still can't get along with you. I'm gonna do things my own way to beat this game, you hear? I see. The words echoed in my head a few times. Eventually, Asuna coughed again and pointedly turned her head away. Also, I have a message from me. Uh, yes? He called me out by name during that battle. It took me a moment to remember. Yes, uh, perhaps I had given her an order directly by name. Sorry, I didn't mean to disrespect you. If that's what you think, or did I pronounce it wrong? Now it was Asuna's turn to look skeptical. Pronounce it wrong? How did you even know it in the first place? I never told you my name, nor did you tell me yours. Huh? I yelled. What did she mean? We were still registered in a party, so there were two HP bars in the upper left of my vision. Beneath the lower of the two was a little label reading Asuna. Wait, are you saying this is your first time being in a party? Yes. I see. I reached up to the right with my right hand and pointed to the left side of Asuna's face. Do you see an extra HP bar over here, in addition to your own? Is anything written beneath it? Uh... Asuna turned her head, so I reached out and stopped it with my fingers. No, if you turn your face, the readouts will move to keep with it. Keep your head still and look to your left. Like this? Her brown eyes awkwardly rolled left, finding a string of letters that I couldn't see. Her graceful lips sounded out three syllables. Kidito. Kidito. That's your name? Yep. Oh, so it was written here the entire time? S suddenly, Austin twitched in surprise. I realized that I had been holding my hand to her cheek for several seconds, almost as though I was initiating the motion for a skill. I pulled my hands back so fast they almost made a zooming sound. After a few seconds, I thought I heard a soft giggle. Was she laughing? Austin of the Kobold Overkiller, master of the perfect linear thrust? That was a sight I wanted to see, but I resisted the urge to turn. The laughing ended all too soon, and she followed it with a soft statement. Actually, Kirito, I came up here to thank you. For the cream bread and the bath? I asked without thinking. She denied it in a mildly terrifying way, and then gave me some thought and agreed that they were a part of it. It's for a lot of things. Thanks for everything. I think I've finally found something here that I want to do. A goal I want to reach. Oh, what's that? I glanced at her. Austin had grinned for just an instant. It's a secret. She stood up and took a step back. I'm going to keep trying. I'll try to survive, to be stronger, until I can reach the place I want to be. I nodded without turning around. I know. You can be stronger. Not just in terms of your fighting skill, but in a much more important personal sense. So take it from me. Someone you trust invites you to a guild? Don't turn them down. There's an absolute limit to what you can accomplish playing solo. For several seconds, the only sound Asuna was made, making was breathing. When she did speak, it was not what I expected to hear. The next time we meet, tell me how you took me out that te took me out of that labyrinth. Sure. I was about to say it was simple, then stopped myself and added, You bet. In fact, there's one more thing I ought to tell you. What I was about to say before the meeting two days ago. That's right. I owed her an explanation. She ought to know that the deaths of 2,000 of her terrible and... De yeah. She ought to know that the deaths of 2,000 and her terrible despair were at least in part my responsibility for being a self-interested beta tester. A beater. But just as I thought about telling her this, Asuna waved it aside. It's fine. I get it. I know what you've been through to get here, and where you'll go from your own, on your own from here. But someday I'll... She broke off 
from there in a whisper. After a brief silence, her voice was calm but firm. See you around, Kirito. There's a creak of a door opening, footsteps, the thump of its clothing. I stayed sitting on the edge of the terrace, jutting from the mountain, until the sensory information of Austin's scent disappeared from the virtual air. I tried to figure out what she meant, but I decided I didn't need to know right away. With a deep breath, I got to my feet, looked at the door Asuna had just passed through, and then turned and started descending the steps. As they wound down the side of the slope, I found myself counting the stairs. Every 48 steps, they turned back the other way into a zigzag pattern. Eventually, the meaning behind that became clear. 48 was 6 times 8, the number of people in a full raid party. If we both had a full complement and beaten the boss without any fatalities, we could have all filled an entire flight from standing to landing, with a step for each member. I doubted the designer of this feature imagined just a single player descending these steps. The path seemed to be foretelling of my travels ahead. Looking forward or back, there was no soul in sight. I walked on, down and down, entirely alone. But after the umpteenth landing of the endless staircase, I noticed a small envelope icon flashing to the right side of my view. It was a friend message, a form of communication that could bridge any floor of Icrat. There were only two players on my friends list, my first friend, Klein, and Argo the Rat. I opened the message to discover that it was from the latter. Sounds like I really put you through the ringer, Keyboy, it said. I marveled at how fast she worked. I scrolled down and read more. But the message was very short. I'll make it up to you by giving you any any single piece of info on the house. Oh, I grinned devilishly and popped up the hollow keyboard as I continued walking down the steps, typing my reply. Why the whiskers? I hit the send button, smiled again, then finally set foot on the soil of the second floor of Einkrad and started walking on the direction of Urbis.